Hello, hello, and we are live. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome, welcome to Minnesota and to XDC 2022. Uh, my name is Jeremy White. Um, I am one of your hosts. This is... I'm Arek, uh, and I'm one of the organizers here, and I work with this guy. Sorry, <laughs> sadly, sorry. <laughs> no worries. Um, other folks of note, uh, Jeremy Newman is right there. Jeremy Newman is kind of a technical specialist, so if you need power or Wi-Fi or have some issue, um, he's your guy. Um, <laughs> right. Um, so, all right, and if and uh, if you have any questions overall, you can talk to me. There's also James Ramey is standing out by the desk. Uh, you can ask him. James, why don't you pop in and say hi? So James is another one of our organizers. Feel free to ask us, any of us, for anything you need. Yep, and first off, we would like to thank our sponsors. So first thing, Platinum sponsor Code Weavers. So this guy made it all happen. So he sponsored the whole thing, and like uh, our company was working on on making the event happen. And gold sponsors are ARM, AMD, NVIDIA, Google, and Microsoft. So thanks to all of them for uh, sponsoring the conference. Uh, silver sponsor are Collabora, the Linux Foundation, Pax Emu, uh, Egalia, and bronze sponsor is Kronos. So huge thank you for all of you to make this thing happen. Uh, so as I said, Codivus uh, are the organizers along with the Xorg Foundation. And this year we are not alone. So this is not only Xorg uh, conference, we also have WineConf, which will start tomorrow, and FOSXR conference 2022, which also will start tomorrow in Bayberg. Yeah, and just mechanically, the way this is going to work is tonight we're going to put the partition wall so the X room will get smaller tomorrow, and then wine will be over there. Um, the FOSS XR guys are going to be in Schulze Hall, which is a ways away. We, 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 don't, we don't like them, so we're sending them way over there. Um, and then the workshop rooms tomorrow are also going to be in Schulze Hall. Uh, in 127, and we'll have more details on that. It's it's fairly obvious. You follow the signs. It, 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 you'll you'll figure it out. I have a question. If we don't like FOSXR guys, why do we give them the proof? Ah, oh, shh, 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 don't. You weren't okay. going to tell the X guys that it was a okay. nice room. Okay, okay. Um, one other note of directions: restrooms are just down this hallway to the just straight down, and then a little bit left. Uh, yeah, so a few useful information. Uh, follow us on Twitter. Uh, there's a Matrix channel and there's a whole Matrix uh, organization. How do you call that? Space? Space. Uh, which has channels for all the conferences. We will also use that for the live QA. So if any people watching this live will have questions, there's a Q&A something something account uh, logged in into each of those channels and they can just ask that and I'll be sitting there and reading those out. Uh, the streams are available uh, at YouTube. We try to have alternative streams this year, but sadly that haven't worked out, so we are constrained only to YouTube. And on the schedule and everything is on our website. Right, and then, so, and I would recommend if, particularly the, we as the Wine Project, we've used the Matrix channel, and we tend to use it as a social connection, and so you can ping folks like myself and Ark or Jeremy Newman on the Matrix channel with those nicks. Um, and if you just want to know where people are going for, you know, drinks or for lunch, it's a, it can be useful. Or if you want to know if a good place to get a power adapter, which I don't think that question was answered. Um, but I think Google will be your best friend for a place to buy a power adapter. There should be places on the Skyway. Target, Target you think will have a power adapter? They okay. Should, yeah. Hopefully. Well, it, Travel Store might have, the, it, depending on which direction. But it, okay. Yeah, in, and if you join the wine channel, you will see that like for the last three days, it's basically coordinating where to get beers. So we focus on the important stuff in the wine project. Yeah, and this is the thing that's also on our main landing page, and this is important for people who are watching from homes. Uh, Indico is a little bit hard to work with at times, and there's a way to make the schedule appear in your local time zone. So you have to log in, you have to find a menu with your name in the upper left corner, and then in my preferences, you can select your time zone, and you can uh, check use my time zone, which should help you a lot, because like dealing with UTC minus five, yeah, yeah. just... I'm from Europe, so. Uh -huh. All right. So then um, another important point we want to make and make sure to remind everyone, you have all agreed by being here. You have agreed to honor the code of conduct uh, put forth by XORG. It is on the website. It's fairly straightforward. It's just, you know, 
This needs to be a safe and comfortable space for everyone. Um, if you have an issue, uh, there are, uh, I'm on there, if my cell phone number is, is on the web page and you can call me and, um, and then there's also Mandy is on there and you can call her uh, and there's a couple other contact points, whoever you're comfortable with, please report an issue. Um, if it is a, um, uh, an incidental event, you know, an, a, a, an, an, an unmeant, an unintentioned, there'll be a warning. But if, it's, if it happens again or is clearly unacceptable, you will be asked to leave the conference. So just please take that very seriously. I'd like everyone to feel comfortable and welcome here. Oh, and here are the contact information. Um, and this is also on the website. So. so that's a reminder to all the speakers. So uh, please, before you talk or after the talk or during the talk, if you're really good at multitasking, uh, upload the slides uh, so when you log in you can find your uh, submissions and there should be like this uh, small crayon symbol next to the presentation materials which allows you to upload everything and this is very important because a lot of people will be reading them a little bit later uh, so let's see actually it, so there will be workshops tomorrow and there are two so far um, and starting tomorrow, we have breakout rooms available. We'll actually have two breakout rooms available. So if you want to have a, a special meeting, just let us know. We can, we can make another room available as needed. Um, they will be in Schulze Hall, which I mentioned, which is, it's, it's, you go down this hallway, there'll be a sign to Schulze Hall. You go across into Terrence Murphy Hall, and then you go over one more skyway into Schulze Hall, and then you go down the grand staircase, and then you'll be there. Got it? Okay. There'll be a quiz later. Yeah. And uh, organizers of those rooms uh, should uh, reach out to me uh, before that. We'll provide them with microphones and they're like in charge of taking notes and uh, going live on Jitsi for any people who want to participate remotely. So this not, won't be streamed on YouTube, but anyone who wants to join in uh, will be able to do that through that Jitsi instance. So yeah, uh, there's also lightning talks and demos uh, blog. Uh, we have them today and on the last day of the conference, I believe. Uh, so for uh, people hosting workshops, please take notes. And uh, if you have any other interesting discussion that you want to report on as well, take notes, create a five minute presentation. This is like a hard cutoff uh, and present them on Thursday during uh, the lightning talks blog. There is like empty block for now, I think. We haven't scheduled anything for that day yet, but yeah, so uh, and if you have some demo to show people, that's up to 10 minutes. We'll have uh, some demos today as well. All right, so this, this is the lunch slide um, and the downtown and finding your way around uh, downtown Minneapolis. And so welcome to the Twin Cities of Minneapolis and St. Paul. Um, so the, the pandemic did hit downtown fairly hard. So there's, there's still a lot of restaurants and a lot of restaurants that are easy to get to. Um, we are, so Minneapolis has the world's largest private skyway. For some reason in January, people don't seem to like walk on outside. I don't know what it, what it is, but. Weird. Um, so, and we're sort of on the edge of it, but if you go out those doors, the doors you came in that you, you are on the skyway system. And if you follow signs for LaSalle Plaza, it's about a two block walk. And then you'll be kind of, the lunch places will start. And so if you kind of want to go explore, it, the, the, the Skyway goes for many, many blocks, so you can go and walk and find a lunch out there. And I would encourage you to do it if you want a novel experience. If you don't want to get lost, go down to the street and use Google. Yeah. Um, um, but I would recommend using our, our, our Habit Trail. Um, and, uh, and I will post in the Matrix chat, we've got a list of eight or ten restaurants that are relatively close. There are more nicer restaurants to sit down, we'll put that list. But then there's also just fast, casual food um, out for lunch during the lunch break. Um, and, then, and then, of course, um, everyone in Minnesota has a, a, a reputation, but one of our things is we're a, a very polite place. So please join us in being polite and kind to the staff who will be working hard and understaffed. So. Yeah, so that's it for the welcome. That's it for the welcome. Are there any logistical questions we can answer at this point? Everyone have enough coffee? Yeah. Uh, 
Yes, there's a UTS. U UST Open. UST Open, yeah. And it has a captive portal. So if you have a hard time uh, joining that and it doesn't pop up, you that, like you don't get the pop up saying, hey, you have to sign in, uh, you can go to neverssl.com. This is a web page that never uses TS TLS, SSL, and it's very good for getting to those capture portals. Any other logistics questions? Okay. All right, so we'll, we'll then, I think our next schedule is at nine. Um, and, and obviously, and I guess just logistically, this hallway out here is, is our hallway track, and we are generally welcome on the university campus, and the campus kind of goes that way. There's some tables and chairs out there, so if you wander out and sit down, no one's going to get fussed at you. Um, and you're, you're obviously very welcome out here, and we'll have snacks throughout the day, and we'll have coffee. And, and there's note that there's two coffee stations, one here and then one for the wine guys. You can use ours today. Um, but not tomorrow, scans off. Um, and I think that's it. So we'll take a break now and we'll reconvene at nine for the first, right? Yes. Very good. Thanks for coming, everyone. Thanks for coming.
Okay. Uh, I think we're starting. Yeah. Uh, well, hi, hi everyone. Uh, I'm Ricardo from Igalia. Uh, most of my work revolves around CTS tests and the Vulkan specification. And today I'll be talking about uh, the new mesh shader extension for Vulkan that was published like a month ago. So I participated in the release process for this extension uh, by writing thousands of uh, tests uh, and reviewing and discussing the specification text for Vulkan, YLSL, and Spruppy. Uh, so mesh shaders are a new way of uh, processing geometry in the graphics pipeline. So essentially, uh, they introduce an alternative way of creating graphics uh, pipelines in Vulkan. Uh, but they don't introduce a completely new type of pipeline. Uh, the new extension is multi-vendor and uh, heavily based on the NVIDIA-only uh, extension that existed before. Uh, but some details are being fine-tuned to make it closer to the uh, DirectX 12 version of mesh shaders and to make it easier to implement for, for other vendors. Um, so I want to cover basically what you see here, what mesh shaders are, uh, how they compare to the classic pipelines and how they solve some some problems. Then uh, we will take a look at what a mesh shader looks like and how it works, and we'll also talk about drawbacks that mesh shaders have. Uh, so mesh shading uh, basically introduces a new type of graphics pipeline uh, with a much smaller number of stages compared to the classic one. Uh, one of the new stages is called the mesh shading stage. Uh, and these new pipelines try to address some issues and shortcomings with the, with the classic pipelines uh, on modern GPUs. The new pipeline stages have many things in common with compute shaders, as we will see. Um, <coughs> so this is a simplified version of the classic pipeline. You probably know it very well. And basically, a pipeline can be divided in two parts. The first stages are in charge of uh, generating geometry uh, for the rasterizer. And then the rasterizer uh, does a lot of magic, including primitive clipping, uh, very centric interpolation, and preparing fragment data for, for fragment shader invocations, obviously. So it's technically possible to replace the whole pipeline with a compute shader. And I think there's a talk on Thursday about that. Uh, <laughs> But mesh shaders do not touch the rasterizer and everything that, that comes after it. Uh, mesh shaders try to apply a compute model to uh, replace some of this with a shader that's similar to compute, but the changes are restricted to the first part of, of the pipeline. So if I have to cut the presentation short for some reason, this is probably one of the slides you should focus on, like mesh shading uh, employs a shader that's similar to compute to generate some geometry for the rasterizer. And there's no input assembly, no, no vertex shader, no tessellation, etc. So everything that you did with those stages is now done in, a, uh, in the new mesh shading stage, which is a bit more flexible and more powerful. Um, and in reality, the mesh shading extension actually introduces two new stages. There's an optional text shader that runs before the mesh shader, but we are going to forget about it for now to simplify things. Uh, so these are the problems that me mesh shading tries to solve. Uh, vertex inputs are a bit annoying to implement in drivers and in, in some hardware they use uh, specific fixed function units that may be a bottleneck in, in some cases, at least in, at least in theory. Uh, the main pain point is that vertex shaders are working at the, at the per vertex level, obviously. So uh, you don't generally have control of how geometry uh, uh, is arranged in primitives. So you may run several vertex shader invocations that end up forming a primitive that faces back and it's not visible, and there's no uh, easy way to filter those out. Uh, so you waste computing power, memory bandwidth, reading data for those vertices, etc. Some implementations do some clever stuff here, uh, trying to avoid these issues. Uh, and finally, tessellation and geometry shaders should perhaps be simpler and more powerful, and it should work like compute shaders, like two, so we process vertices in parallel and more efficiently and everything. So, uh, so far, uh, I've told you that mesh shaders look, look a bit like compute shaders, and they need to generate geometry for the rasterizer. Uh, because they're, uh, so let's let's take a look. Uh, I'm going to give you an example in YLSL to make it uh, easier to read as, and so you can see it needs a new extension, which, uh, when translated to SPIRV will be converted into a SPIRV extension that gives you access to some new opcodes and new functionality, obviously. Uh, the first 
similarity to compute shaders is that mesh shaders are dispatched in uh, three groups, work groups like, like compute shaders. And each of them has a number of local invocations in 3D controlled by the shader itself. Uh, same deal. There, there's a limit to the size of uh, each work group, uh, but the minimum mandatory limit by the, by the, speci by the specification sorry, is 128 invocations. And if the hardware does not support uh, work groups that size, they are going to be, they are going to be emulated. Um, <coughs> we also have a properties structure in in Vulkan, where you can check which is which is the recommended maximum size for work groups according to to the driver. Uh, and inside the body of your shader, you get access to the typical LTNs for compute shaders, like the number of work groups, work group ID, local invocation indices, etc. Obviously, and if subgroups are supported, you may also get uh, you can also use a group operations and built-ins and everything in that. Uh, but mesh shaders also have to generate geometry somehow. So the type uh, cannot be chosen at certain time. So when writing a shader, you have to decide if your shader will, will output triangles, lines, or points. And you have to say that in the shader. That's the first thing, different from compute shaders. Uh, then you must also indicate like an upper limit in the number of vertices and primitives that you are going to generate with each work group. Uh, generally speaking, this is going to be a smallish number. So in fact, in, in practice, several implementations will limit you to 256 vertices and primitives uh, at most, which is the minimum required limit uh, according to the specification. And to handle big meshes with this, you will need several work groups, and each work group will handle a, a piece of the whole mesh, obviously. Uh, in each work group, the local invocations are supposed to cooperate to generate arrays of uh, vertex and primitive data. So <coughs> uh, here you can see how. After perhaps some initial processing, you, you cannot see here, you have to indicate how many actual vertices and primitives the work group will emit using this uh, set mesh outputs ext call. Uh, and that call goes first before filling any output arrays, and you can reason about it as letting the implementation allocate the appropriate amount of memory for those output arrays or something like that. Mesh shaders output uh, index geometry, like when you use vertex and index buffers together. So. Uh, you need to write data for each vertex to an output array and uh, primitive indices to another output array. Uh, typically, uh, each invocation uh, handles one position or a chunk of those arrays, uh, and so they cooperate together to fill the whole thing. And in the slide here, you see a couple of those arrays, which is, are the most typical ones. So you have the built-in mesh, uh, mesh vertices ext array, which contains per vertex data. Um, <coughs> like uh, the vertex position, and this is used with this array going from zero to the actual number of vertices minus one, obviously. And then the primitive triangle indices ext array contains uh, for each triangle three uint indices into the previous vertices array. That's how it works. Um, uh, the, pri the primitive indices array uh, itself is accessed using indices from zero to actual uh, to the actual number of primitives minus one, obviously. And so if there's a second uh, slide that I want you to remember, uh, it's probably this one. What you, we have here is like an initial template to write any uh, mesh shader. Uh, for example, I, I used like a template like this one when I was writing CTS tests for the extension. Uh, there are a few more details we can add, obviously, to the shader. Uh, for example, mesh shaders can also generate custom output attributes that will be interpolated and, and used as input to the, to the fragment shader, uh, just like vertex shaders can. Uh, the difference is that in mesh shaders, they form arrays. Uh, um, so if we uh, say nothing, like in the first output here, uh, they are considered per vertex and they have the same index range as the mesh vertices array. And a nice addition for mesh shaders is that, is that you can use the per primitive ext uh, keyword to indicate that output attributes are per primitive, right? Uh, and do not need to be interpolated like the second output you can see there. Uh, if you use this, you need to declare them with the same keyword in the fragment shader, so the interfaces uh, match between mesh and fragment. Um, 
indices to these arrays uh, have the same range as the built-in uh, primitive indices array, obviously. And of course, if there is no input assembly, uh, we need to read data from, from somewhere. So uh, typically, you use descriptors like storage buffers, containing vertex, maybe index information, whatever, or you can also generate geometry using compute. That also works, anything works. Um, so just to show you a few more details, these are uh, the built-in arrays used for geometry. There are arrays of indices for, for triangles, lines, or points. Uh, depending on what the shader is supposed to generate. Uh, and the mesh vertex CXT array that we saw before can contain a bit more data apart from the position. You have the point size, the clip distances, and cool distances, for example. And then there's a third array that I didn't use before. I'm showing it here for the first time. Uh, you can see it's per primitive. Uh, it's declared with a keyword. And uh, you can indicate a few things like the primitive ID, uh, the layer, the viewport index, whatever you can modify an output per primitive data from there. Um, so as I mentioned before, uh, each word group can only emit a relatively small number of uh, primitives and vertices. So for big models, uh, you need to dispatch several word groups, and each of them is in charge of generating and processing what is usually called a meshlet, which are the colored patches that you see here on the bunny. Uh, and it's worth men mentioning that the subdivision of uh, big meshes into meshlets is typically done when preparing assets for the application. So, I mean, there shouldn't be any runtime delay when preparing the meshlets. They are pre-chosen, basically. Uh, and then uh, mesh shading word groups are dispatched with uh, specific commands inside a render pass. And they work very similar to compute dispatches. As you can see here, you specify a 3D size and then launch a number of work groups for those. Uh, so let's talk a bit about uh, task shaders, uh, which are optional in theory, but then Tim will tell you a bit more about them. Uh, if, if they are present, they, they go before mesh shaders. And the dispatch comments that we just saw uh, do not control the number of mesh shader workgroups. They control the number of task shader workgroups that are dispatched. And then each task shader workgroup will dispatch a number of mesh shader workgroups, and it can decide that at runtime. So it looks like this. Uh, each task shader workgroups also follows the, the compute model uh, with a number of local invocations uh, that cooperate together. And each word group typically pr processes geometry in, in some way and amplifies or reduces the amount of work that needs to be done. So that's why it's called uh, the amplification shader, shader in DirectX 12. And once that pre-processing is done, each task word group decides at runtime how many mesh word groups to launch as childs. They form a, a tree with two levels. Um, one interesting detail about this is that compute built-ins in uh, mesh shaders may not be unique when, when using task shaders. They are only unique per branch. So in this example, we dispatch a couple of task shader work groups, and each of them decided to dispatch two and uh, three mesh shader work groups res respectively. So some mesh shaders work groups uh, will have the same work group ID. And even if, if the second task shader work group had launched uh, two children instead of three, even the number of work groups would be the same for all those. So uh, we probably want them to process different things. Uh, so the way to tell them apart from inside the mesh shader is, uh, is to use a payload, which is a piece of data that is generated in each task work group and uh, is uh, passed down to its children as uh, read-only data. Uh, combining the payload with existing built-ins allows you to process different things in each mesh shader work group. That's basically how it's done. Uh, this is done like this. I just put you in a sample there. So on the left, you have a task shader. It's the first uh, one I show you. Uh, you can see it, w it also works like a compute shader, and invocations cooperate to pre-process the staff and to generate the payload. Uh, and the payload is a variable declared with a task payload shared EXT qualifier. So these payloads work like shared memory from the task shader. And that's why they have the shared in the qualifier, obviously. And in the mesh shader, 
they are read only. You can declare them the same payload as in the task shader and you can read data from it. Uh, so advantages of mesh shaders. Um, you first of all you you can avoid input assembly bottlenecks if they exist. And you can pre-compute data and discard geometry in advance, uh, saving processing power and memory band bandwidth. Uh, geometry and tessellation uh, can be applied freely, uh, more flexible ways. You can do whatever you want because you're in a computer-like shader. And uh, in more flexible ways. Uh, and the use of a model similar to compute allows shaders to take advantage, advantage of uh, GPU processing power more effectively, in theory. Uh, many games, for example, also use a compute pre-pass to process some data and calculate things that will uh, be needed at draw time. Uh, and with mesh shaders, it may be possible to streamline this and integrate this processing into the mesh or more commonly the task shader. Uh, and you can also abuse mesh shader, mesh shading pipelines as compute pipelines with two levels if you need to do so. Uh, these advantages of uh, mesh shading, uh, for example, mesh shading is problematic for tiling GPUs, as you can imagine, for uh, reasons similar to tessellation geometry shaders, uh, because uh, those reasons. And giving users freedom in this part of the pipeline may allow them to, to shoot themselves in the foot and end up with suboptimal performance. Uh, Timur will, will tell you some performance tips uh, about that. Uh, if not used properly, mesh shaders may be slower than classic pipelines. Uh, so the structure of uh, vertex and index buffers sometimes also needs to be declared explicitly in shaders to read, read from them, uh, like storage buffers. So that increases the coupling between CPU and GPU code, which is not nice. But probably the most important drawback of mesh shading right now is that it's hard or sometimes even impossible, like we could say, uh, to write a single mesh shader that performs great on all implementations. That's the main disadvantage. So some vendor uh, preferences are exposed as properties by the extension, uh, and you can read those. And you, you can see that NVIDIA loves uh, smaller work groups, if possible, and using loops to encode to generate geometry with, with each invocation. So several vertices and triangles per invocation. That's what NVIDIA likes a lot. And then threads on AMD, and they typically can only generate at most one vertex and one primitive. Uh, so they love you to use uh, bigger word groups and use the local invocation index to access per vertex and per primitive arrays. So they can apply a lot of optimizations and everything. Uh, so as you can imagine, this probably results in different mesh shaders for each vendor, uh, even if both are mesh shaders. And that's it. Uh, questions? <laughs> Careful. I'm curious just about um, if you look at uh, Metal 3, is there a mesh shader implementation and how that is capable and how that compares with the. Sorry, can, can you repeat? Uh, the Apple uh, in Metal 3, as well as the community in Metal 3, they have mesh shader support to interface. I'm just curious how that compares to the reflected in the system. So the question is how, uh, I had to repeat the question for people. Uh, yeah. So the question is how do mesh shaders in uh, Apple Metal uh, differ from this? And it's a bummer because I have no idea. I have never worked on, on Metal, uh, so there's. <laughs> Uh, I don't know. It's a, I, I think in theory it's possible because you can emulate basically. Uh, Timur wants to say something. Uh, oh yeah, I have to repeat the question. If, the, if, the, um, if it's possible to emulate the classic pipeline using mesh shaders. And in theory it is using some tricks because uh, you have the vertex input assembly so you can generate mesh shader code uh, for reading that and then everything works the same. So, but you have to 
use com uh, mesh shaders to, to emulate uh, tessellation and, and geometry shaders. It's going to be a bit more complex, but yeah, in theory, I think it can be done because it uses the same hardware in practice. Um, I just want to ask, would it, be, would it make sense to characterize half shaders as something that basically is yeah, and so the question is if uh, task shaders are used to decide the uh, are used to decide how to dispatch the shaders. Yeah, so, so that's basically what they are used. They are called the amplification shaders. Oh, and they you can decide, for example, Timur will tell you more about that, but you can use it to for for uh, choosing load levels or load detail. Or you can uh, cut in th cuts in short. You're like this is not visible. This whole thing is not visible. So I'm not going to launch anything to try to generate geometry for this part of, of the scene or something like that. Yeah, they can be task shaders. Usually uh, try to pre-process geometry and, and do some selection and, and uh, launch the appropriate number of mesh shader workgroups so it works optimally and doesn't you doesn't waste hardware resources. So it's very important in practice. It's very important to use task shaders to decide how many mesh work groups you really need and, and to do some, some work there. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank
Welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Timur Kristof. Uh, I work for Valve uh, at the Linux Open Source Graphics Drivers Group. And uh, today I am here uh, to talk to uh, you guys about uh, how mesh shading is implemented in Mesa. So uh, everyone saw Ricardo's talk, I hope. Uh, but just in case somebody didn't, I'm going to do a very quick recap of mesh shading. Uh, so uh, the good part is it uh, that you get a whole new programming model with lots of flexibility, lots of power. So you can do geometry processing and uh, you can process very highly detailed scenes with many vertices, many primitives. The bad side is that it takes a lot of effort to integrate into your applications. And uh, the ugly part is that uh, the new API is quite low level. So you have to do a lot of work to match the performance which you would get from the existing traditional pipeline. And uh, the main thing, as Ricardo already said, uh, it's uh, mesh shaders are compute-like. Uh, basically, instead of just passing through some input vertices, uh, they can create uh, vertices and dot primitives. And uh, this eliminates uh, some bottlenecks from fixed function hardware like input assembly and tessellation. Uh, the, also, the sad thing is that it's not suitable for tiling GPUs. At least the current spec isn't. Uh, but as far as I know, Kronos might be working on something. Uh, anyway, so this is how the mesh shading pipeline looks like. Uh, but I wouldn't recommend anyone uh, to do this. So this just has a mesh shader and a fragment shader. Uh, but uh, most of the performance you can get by adding a task shader to your pipeline. So I would recommend uh, also using a task shader. And uh, task shaders and mesh shaders both uh, work in ver groups, similar to how compute does. And uh, they feed directly into the rasterizer, which then rasterizes them the same way as you would get in a traditional pipeline. So mostly, uh, Ricardo, that didn't really talk about the task shaders that much. Uh, so with a task shader, uh, you basically uh, have to process uh, meshlets. So one task shader invocation usually processes a whole meshlet. A meshlet is a collection of vertices and primitives, usually uh, like maybe 128 or 256 vertices and or primitives. So each invocation of a task shader can decide whether to render a specific meshlet or not. And then uh, it launches uh, mesh shader ver groups for the meshlets which should be visible. And in the mesh shader, uh, the whole ver group is responsible for one meshlet. So you can already see here that one invocation in the task shader mostly corresponds to a whole ver group of the mesh shader, which means that if you implement some coarse culling in your task shader, you can avoid launching mesh shader ver groups entirely. And that's where you can get most of the additional performance from. And uh, in the mesh shader, each invocation can process any number of vertices and or primitives in the programming model. That's not exactly true for the hardware, though. Um, I will show you later how, how that works. Um, so uh, in a nutshell, the task shader answers the question, how many mesh shader ver groups do you want? And then it can have an optional payload output. And the mesh shader then takes that and feeds something to the rasterizer directly. And every detail about what kind of inputs you use, where do you get your inputs from, that's all up to the application. So there are two main use cases. One is meshlets, which we already discussed. And the other is procedural geometry, which means uh, that you can write an application which generates all of his geometry on the fly, uh, which means that you don't have to have any memory access at all. So uh, if you have a mathematical formula which describes some shape, you can implement that formula in mesh shaders, and then uh, it will just render without any, any inputs. Uh, so in the task shader, Ricardo already talked about this a little, uh, you can do uh, geometry amplification, level of detail selection, coarse culling, which I highly recommend, 
And also, if you want to use task and mesh shaders, I highly recommend that you replace your compute prepasses with the task shader. So if you already have a compute prepass, which gets rid of some primitives, that means that you basically duplicate some of the work. So I, I don't recommend that. I, I recommend that you replace that with the task shader. And uh, in the mesh shader, uh, if you are generating a mesh from some inputs, you can do per triangle culling. And as, as mentioned before, you can procedurally generate some shapes. So let's get into the actually interesting part. How does this all work under the hood? So let's uh, pop the hood open and look, look inside. So we started this work in September. When we started, there was no cross-vendor extension, only an NVIDIA-specific one. There were no test cases, no CTS, and no apps. Uh, we have an MV sample application, but that, that's it. So we, we have to, I had to uh, start from scratch. And we made some good progress. So uh, by the end of last year, we already had uh, mesh-only pipeline support in Mesa. And earlier this year, we merged uh, task shaders. And of course, by now, we also have the cross-vendor extension that Ricardo was talking about. So uh, the first thing that you have to consider, uh, what can your hardware do? And how can you map that functionality to the programming model? And uh, for example, one question is, like I said that according to the programming model, the mesh shader feeds the rasterizer directly. But what does that actually mean? Where, where does the output go? So for NVIDIA, it uses a shared memory-like thing. For Intel, I guess it's uh, URB memory, but uh, there are some Intel people here who I think know better than me. For AMD, it's something called the export space, uh, because we use so-called export instructions to output them. Uh, so you might have heard NGG in some conversations online. So it's the hardware stage on, NVD, uh, on uh, AMD hardware, uh, which is responsible for all geometry processing. And it has some pretty strict limitations compared to the programming model that we showed you before. So uh, on AMD, one SIMD lane can output only up to one vertex and one primitive. And each work group only has up to 32K shared memory. And uh, it only has a one-dimensional work group ID. Um, but this is in contrast uh, with the program. So yeah, so this is the illustration. Like each lane outputs just one vertex, just one primitive, and that's it. Uh, but in the programming model, any shader invocation can write any vertex, any primitive. They have to have up to 48K shared memory per work group. And uh, the programming model has uh, 3D work groups, not one dimensional. So it looks like this, each invocation could theoretically output basically anything. Um, I hope that the colors are visible. So how do we implement this? And, and this is where it gets really messy. So we have this thing called LDS, also known as shared memory. So the implementation basically lowers each output write into a shared memory write. And then at the very end, each shader invocation loads the actual output from shared memory or LDS and then exports it. And this is pretty tough because you get a lot of overhead from writing to shared memory and reading it back. So uh, we have an optimization which avoids this. So if you write a mesh shader and you use the local invocation index to address your outputs, then this is not necessary because in that case, the compiler can prove that you only write one vertex and one primitive in your shader. So uh, in the general case, of course, uh, you can think about like if you can have only one vertex, only one primitive, that means that what happens if you specify a work group size which is smaller? So let's say that you have a shader. You say you have 32 invocations in your work group but you want to output 128 vertices. And on AMD, that means we have to launch 
a ver group size of 128, where the first 32 invocations will do all the work that you actually coded in your shader, and the rest are just sitting there unoccupied, doing nothing, just waiting for the other ones to complete. And this is pretty wasteful. So I recommend that when you are writing a mesh shader and you want it to perform well on AMD, uh, you should match the ver group size to the maximum outputs. I mean, the maximum number of vertices and primitives so that you don't get that ugly red unoccupied area. Uh, so that's, that's it for mesh shaders. Those are the main pain points when implementing them. How about task shaders? And there are some interesting considerations here. So task shaders need to be able to dispatch mesh shader work groups. And uh, they need some mechanism for implementing the payloads. And of course, uh, we should allow them to run in parallel with mesh shader invocations to get optimal performance and occupancy from the GPU. So how, how do we do that? So when we started working on this, I think last year, we were having some interesting discussions about what can the hardware do? What, what can we use to implement all of this? And the, our first two idea was that we could abuse the tessellator and basically run that in points mode or something, and then we would get as many invocations as we need. But that sounds like we are just reintroducing the bottleneck that we wanted to avoid in the first place. So we didn't actually do that. The second idea was, well, we could implement our own compute prepass in the driver, uh, but that, then that's also problematic because it has an extra barrier. So what ended up happening is that AMD has a firmware-based solution for all of this, and uh, the other manufacturers seem to just abuse the tessellator. At least that, that's how they explained it to me. So uh, what does this actually mean? What is this firmware-based solution? And uh, this is where it gets really uh, difficult and interesting. So uh, you saw the uh, graph about the pipeline, and in there, task shaders are just regular old graphics shaders in a graphics pipeline. Well, the problem is that AMD requires them to be executed on a different hardware queue, which is, uh, they call it the async compute queue, or ACE for short. And so uh, most of the difficulty in the driver implementation comes from trying to pretend to the application that you just have one queue, the graphics queue, where you execute everything. But in reality, in the driver, we actually have to submit the work to two queues at the same time. So how does that actually look like? So we have this async compute queue, uh, which I just abbreviated as ACEQ. It has some command which executes the task shaders. And running in parallel with this, you also have the graphics queue which executes the mesh shaders. And this means that there is an implicit wait between the two queues. So, of course, mesh shaders can't be launched until the task shader decided how many of them you want to launch. So, this uh, task uh, mesh dispatch on the graphics side, it needs to wait, obviously, for the other dispatch on the compute side. And, uh, of course, uh, if there is no room to launch everything at once, that means that the compute queue also has to wait for the graphics queue. And this leads to synchronization issues. Um, but first, let's see how that actually, how this works. So, you get a dispatch on the compute queue, you run some work groups of task shaders. In, in this example, you can see it's two. And uh, they write to a location in VRAM, which is called a drawing, how many mesh shader invocations do you want to launch? And in this case, uh, they launch N and M of our groups of mesh shaders. And uh, if they, uh, so if the application also uses payloads, there is another ring buffer, which we call the payload ring which contains all the data, which is up to 16K per work group. And then uh, the mesh shaders read from the same location in VRAM. So, as I said, uh, the main issue here is synchronizing the two queues. And let's look at why. So, I said there is this implicit wait, but what happens if you also have a transfer operation and a barrier? 
So since the application only sees all of this as just one queue to which it submits all work, it might have a transfer command and a barrier. And then, uh, well, in this drawing, it seems to be fine. But what happens if the compute queue doesn't have any work before that and starts to dispatch earlier? So what, what uh, looks like there is some problem because it doesn't wait for the barrier, right? So you get a synchronization bug, essentially a race condition. So how, how do we solve this? Essentially, uh, we have to implement some explicit synchronization between the two queues. So essentially, uh, we emit a packet which writes to some piece of memory. And on the compute queue, we have a packet which waits until that is written. So uh, that's how we solved uh, the synchronization. But then what happens when multiple processes use this feature? And this is an interesting thing because up until now, everything seemed straightforward and we had a working implementation, but we noticed when we, when we run the CTS tests, they randomly hang the GPU and we couldn't see why until we realized this. So when you have two applications which use this mechanism, obviously, if they are ordered in, in the correct way, then there is no problem. Uh, but the kernel actually doesn't give you any guarantee between the two submissions. So you submit some pieces of work to the compute queue, some pieces of work to the graphics queue, and the kernel might decide to swap the order. It can do that. It doesn't promise you that it doesn't do that. So in that case, you get a big deadlock. And uh, uh, well, how, how do we actually solve this? And it turns out this is not possible to solve in user space. Uh, so the proper solution is called gang submit. It's uh, recently merged into the kernel. And uh, what this means is that uh, you get uh, one uh, submit for both queues at the same time. And the kernel is now aware that these belong to the same job, basically. So it schedules the two jobs together. And this means there can be no mix up between the different applications. The drawback is that this is not available in any kernel which is released yet. So you can't upgrade your kernel and you can't make it work. So until this happens, uh, we have disabled this feature uh, unless you have this environment variable here. So we can run a mesh shading app using uh, red vperf test xms, um, which is implemented using uh, scheduled dependencies instead of gang submit for now. We hope this will change soon when uh, actually the kernel releases this feature. So uh, I'm, I talked about a lot of things, but where can you actually find the code in Mesa? So uh, we have a lot of uh, driver specific neural lowering passes. So now uh, these days our philosophy in RadV is that we don't implement IO directly in the compiler, but instead we implement all of it in neural lowerings. So we have a couple of these. And of course, uh, there needed to be significant refactoring in RadV to handle these uh, two submissions at the same time. And there is one last thing I'd like to show you, uh, which is the NVIDIA cat scene demo application. So this is uh, basically an app which shows some really heavy geometry. Uh, it has 32 million triangles in total and 16K draw calls, which is, I think, a lot. So I'm going to uh, show you this demo now. And it fits. Okay, that's great. So basically this app shows you how to implement task and mesh shaders. It has examples for the shaders and it's very configurable. So you get uh, various settings about all the parameters that, that we discussed earlier. So you can choose to regenerate the meshlets. Like uh, you have a number of how many vertices you want in your meshlets, how many primitives, etc. And then uh, you can select uh, whether or not you want to execute uh, with mesh shaders or with the classic pipeline, etc. 
So now it's uh, VK standard, but now let's uh, switch it to uh, the mesh shader extension. And it's very helpful. It tells you the frame time also. So you can see it's uh, 14 milliseconds now. And uh, with the, just the standard, it's, uh, well, also around the same. So this would already indicate that you don't automatically get good performance just because you wrote a mesh shader. Uh, but when we start tweaking these, like let's say we want 128 vertices and 128 primitives. And then it's already a bit different. You can also tweak like how many meshlets do you want each task per group to process? And uh, what is the minimum number of uh, meshlets for, for each uh, task shader? And so uh, we can play around with this a little bit. I, I don't actually remember what was the most optimal combination. So uh, I'm just showing that there is many different possibilities here. And also uh, it has uh, various other preferences. So uh, you could select to compact the output. You could say, uh, let's use per primitive culling. And now you see it's, uh, it performs a little bit better. So it has endless options. I, I don't want to waste your time on all of this. Uh, but if you guys are interested in mesh shading, I highly recommend looking at this sample uh, because it, it has everything, basically. So thank you very much for your attention. And if you have some questions, uh, now is the time to ask. So, um, implementing the task shaders on the compute uh, pipeline, won't that interfere if you have long running compute uh, tasks running from the application side? So the question is, uh, because the implementation runs task shaders on the compute queue, uh, does that interfere with whatever the application itself is running on the compute queue? And the answer is no, it doesn't. It's basically a different job submission. So both jobs run in some order, depending on how the kernel schedules them, but they shouldn't interfere. Well, let's hope that the kernel scheduler does the right thing and uses the proper queue, which doesn't have the long running job. But the application can't really control that. Yeah, that sucks. Yeah. So, sorry, I, I will repeat. So the question was, what if the application already saturates the compute queue? And I, I replied, yeah, that, that sucks. Then that means you will have to wait until that work is done. Yeah. So Buzz says, uh, just repeating for the stream, mm -hmm. that AMD has multiple compute queues. So one solution for this could be that the driver hides one of them from the application. question is, what can we do if the application uses a suboptimal configuration? Well, uh, the honest answer is not much really. So uh, the mesh shader is intended to be a low level tool, which means that we push uh, all of these decisions to the application. And if the application makes a bad decision, that means it will perform badly. S sorry to disappoint. Okay, the question uh, is that why are they not uh, optimal on tiling GPUs? And uh, 
Well, I can only speculate. You would have to ask somebody who works on a Tiling GPU to give you an accurate answer. But according to my understanding, the main issue there is that uh, they don't behave well uh, with binning. So the problem is that one mesh group could output vertices basically anywhere. It could have any position. And that would cause issues with the binner because it would really prefer if all of them would be in the same tile, but they are not. I mean, for more details, uh, please ask somebody who works on, on the Tiling GPU. We have plenty of people here who work on Tiling GPUs, right? What is an example of a tiling GPU? Well, ARM, Qualcomm, Imagination. So almost all or all mobile vendors are tiling GPUs. Well, if there's no more th uh, questions, uh, thanks.
Hello. Can you hear me? All right. So, hello, everybody. Uh, see if we can get people to quiet down a little bit. There we go. All right. So, uh, my name is Jason Ekstrand, and I'm going to be talking about how to write a Vulcan driver in 2022. Um, so a little bit about me, for those of you that don't know, most people who I think know me at this point, but if you don't, uh, my name is Jason Ekstrand, uh, J Ekstrand on IOC. Uh, I have been around since about 2013. Uh, I started off in the Wayland world, um, and then I moved over to Intel, where I was working on their 3D driver stack. Um, there I did no, I did the Intel Vulkan driver, the Spurvy Dino parser, ISIL, a bunch of other Intel bits. Um, and by the time I left, I was basically the lead Vulcan person. I was also uh, their, one of the Kronos reps for a while. Um, then in January this year, I moved over to Calabra, where my new job is basically to do whatever is needed in the upstream graphics stack uh, to make Linux more awesome. Um, so far, most of it has been working on the Vulcan runtime in Mesa and patching things into various drivers. Uh, which has put me in PanVK, RadV, Intel. Uh, I've worked on Raspberry Pi for a few weeks, um, kind of all over the stack. Uh, and so what we're going to be talking about today is a bit about that work and sort of best practices for writing Vulkan drivers uh, in a modern Mesa. So we'll start off with a little bit of history. Um, the Intel Vulkan driver was first merged in April of 2016. Uh, we actually started that project in April of 2015, um, but it had to be behind closed doors because of Konos NDAs for about eight to 10 months. Um, and then it took another couple of months to get it merged because we had to do a bunch of upstream refactoring uh, that we couldn't admit to prior to the Vulkan release. Um, and we basically, what that was is moving uh, a bunch of stuff into the source Intel folder um, because the compiler was, everything was living in the so Mesa, drivers, DRI, blah, 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 blah. Um, then uh, in October of that year, RadV was merged. Um, RadV started off as Dave took the Mesa code, the, the, the AMV code, copied and pasted it into a new folder, changed all the names, deleted all the Intel stuff, and started writing an AMD driver. Um, every other Vulkan driver in Mesa has basically started this way. Somebody copies and pastes another driver, deletes all of the hardware specific parts, and starts typing. Um, this leads to, this has led to quite a bit of sort of copy and paste, and I have been working over the course of the last two years to try and remove as much of this as possible. Um, the first significant common component was the Windows system code. Um, when RadV was originally merged, I told Dave that one of the conditions of merging it was to deduplicate Windows system between uh, Intel and AMD because I didn't want both of us writing X11 code wrong differently. Um, and that, that was what it was. It was wrong in both of them, and it was different. Um, then in 2020, when the X private data extension came out, um, I started building some common code. Uh, started with a common base object that everybody could use that held all the private data bits. Um, there was nothing hardware specific about that, so I figured, you know, let's, let's go ahead and do that. Um, we also added common entry point table generators. Uh, those were big giant piles of Python that parsed XML and dumped out C code that was copied and pasted from driver to driver. And by that point, it was starting to become a problem because every time we bumped the core Vulkan version, we would have XML format changes that we would then have to replicate across all of the drivers before we could merge the new XML, and it was getting to be a maintenance headache. Um, then, uh, this year, a bunch of stuff has happened. Um, I built a common render pass implementation so that you can implement just dynamic rendering in your driver, and render passes happen by magic. Uh, I did some common Vulkan state tracking, which merged, um, and then I also have some common Vulkan meta code for copy blitz and clears that's sitting in a branch that is hopefully going to land this year sometime. Um, so that's kind of quick history. I did not put all the other Vulkan drivers in there and find dates for them, but there have been a lot of other Vulcan drivers added. We're up to eight now, I think. Seven, eight, something like that. Um, okay, so this is gonna be sort of a, not really a, a tutorial, but more of a, just like, here's the different pieces and here's how you would go about it if you were doing it from scratch today. Um, 
So first of all, this is pretty common. This is the direct, basic directory structure. So you have some so slash hardware folder. Um, some people have gone with the actual name of the company, like so AMD, so Intel. Some of them have gone with so pan frost or so Fudino to use the more open source friendly name. Um, and then in there, you've got your compiler, which is shared with the GL driver. Um, maybe some other bits, like Intel has an image layout library. They've got some stuff for generating uh, pack, pack headers from XML um, and a bunch of other stuff in there. And then you've got your Vulkan directory that contains the, the actual Vulkan driver. That's the general structure. You don't have to do that. This is a C project. There's nothing enforced. But this is the way that most of them are organized. Um, so starting off, uh, every Vulkan object that you create needs to derive from VK base, base object. Um, this is the, the sort of base if thinking in terms of object-oriented programming, this is the base object that everything needs to derive from. It handles private data. Um, it also, you can use uh, VK to find handle casts that will define cast functions to get you to and from the VK device or whatever handle name. Um, and a bunch of that stuff is dealt with there. And we also do some like runtime type checking and stuff in there that's, that's handy. Um, you can also derive from other object types. So we have more specific things like VK device, which has some nice stuff for devices in it, and VK image and VKQ, um, and then those derive from the base struct. So again, it's it's your standard CS101 object-oriented programming course. Um, then the common dispatch framework is where stuff really starts happening for you. So the base requirement is that you have to use VK instance, VK physical device, and VK device, and these contain all of the dispatch tables for actually providing entry points to the application. Um, and they also contain some stuff about enabled extensions, disabled extensions, et cetera. Um, everything else needs to still needs to derive from VK base object or something else, but the, the instance, physical device, and device absolutely have to derive from the base objects. Um, you then use this VK entry points gen script um, somewhere in your driver directory. You call it from your Mason, and it will generate entry point tables with driver name prefixed entry points for everything, and then automatically populate. And then it also generates extern tables that you can then hand in when you initialize the objects. Um, and then from there, VK get proc address is implemented for you. Um, part of the reason for the base objects is that we track enabled extensions, and we automatically deal with all of the nonsense in Vulkan about how if certain extensions aren't enabled, then you have to return null from get proc address, and that whole mess just gets auto magic um, there's a lot of code gen that makes that happen. Uh, so that's that. This is sort of the base. This everybody should do this. If you're not doing this, I will knock your driver. But I don't think that there's any any problems here anymore. We've all gotten converted. Um, once you have this, you can also delete all of your VK foo to VK foo two wrappers. So there's piles of places in the spec where we have extended, um, where we we had a version of the function and then we needed it to be able to extend it because we ripped out all the extensibility in Vulkan 1.0, which was a mistake. Um, and so there's a bunch of places where we have a, a thing and then a thing two, and there's a few thing threes, but not very many. Um, and so we have all of these common wrappers, and all they do is they implement the old entry point in terms of the new entry point. Um, and usually that just means taking function parameters and shoving them in an extensible struct and then calling it. Um, and so in your driver, what this means is that you should never implement the base version. You should always implement the most recent version that's available in the spec. And we will go in and fill, all, fill in all the others. And the important thing to know, a bunch of people have missed this, um, is that you do not need to implement the future looking extension yet. We will just go ahead and handle that. Um, so even if you haven't implemented, say, copy commands to the extension, you should still implement the two version of all the copy commands because that way you don't have to deal with it later. Um, you don't even have to worry about the rename. Uh, this also means this also works for synchronization too, which is a bit more complicated. Um, it added two versions of piles of bit fields that are now 64 bits, and there's a bunch of reshuffling that had to happen for that. And most of that is handled for you if you just implement um, uh, the the two entry points. So. It's very convenient. It gets rid of a lot of boilerplate that we were all retyping. Um, and that's um, another one is logging. I won't spend a whole lot of time on this. Uh, we have log macros. It's in vklog.h. Um, 
the big thing that this gets you is that it points to standard error, VKKHO debug utils, and VKK EXT debug report. Um, so it reports all of the places, all the things, you just call the logging helpers and off you go. Um, these also work through, I think they go through the Mesa logging framework. There's a lot of logging frameworks in Mesa, um, but they plumb through most of the right places. Um, so it will show up in debug tools and if people are doing captures, it should show up there as well. Um, we've also done some stuff around error reporting. Um, this is pretty standard for people who've been working on Vulkan drivers for a while because we inherited this from the Intel driver. Um, but basically, if you re wrap error codes in the VK error ref, it allows you to also provide a message and this gets logged when the error gets printed with a line number and stuff so you can easily find where that error came from in the driver. Um, we also recently added support for uh, error handling on command buffer recording. So it, with command buffers, most of the recording functions return void, not an error code, and you're expected to just set it on the command buffer and, and keep going. So we have facilities for handling that. Most of the drivers are converted at this point. The Intel driver isn't because it's annoyingly complicated um, because of some decisions that I made that might not have been the best ones. But um, I do have an MR somewhere. I just haven't gotten Lionel to review it yet. Um, we also have device lost reporting, which again, it's the same sort of a thing. Uh, device lost messages are supposed to be sticky, where once you return it, you're supposed to continue returning it. And so there's some helpers to deal with that and also do it in a as thread safe as reasonably possible way. Um, it's that one's tricky because you can end up with device lost coming from any thread and then it should theoretically show up on everything eventually. And we should in theory handle that propagation now um, if you use the helpers. And again, I think most of the drivers are converted, but I'm not sure if like the new imagination one that's is converted yet or not. Um, okay, now let's get to the actually interesting stuff. Um, so most of the stuff that I've just talked about is basically boilerplate. It was, we did something clever in one of the drivers and all the other drivers copied and pasted it, but it wasn't actually that much code. It's mostly a matter of making sure that it's consistent and correct. Um, synchronization is where things really started to get interesting. And it was mostly okay up until we implemented timeline semaphores. And then the Intel people and the AMD people both implemented them wrong differently. And there was a lot of back and forth. And eventually I just said, I'm done with this. I'm doing synchronization in common code and we're gonna get it right this time. Um, and so the, the rule of thumb here is that unless you are a very, very magic driver, which currently the only driver that I am allowing to be sufficiently magic is um, the Venus driver because they're trying to map Vulcan primitives inside the VM to Vulcan primitives outside the VM and that's kind of okay. Um, but every other driver goes through the common synchronization framework. And so the moral of the story is do not write implement VK, that should be VK fence, not VK event. Do not implement VK fence or VK semaphore yourself. Um, instead, there are this VK sync type, which has like a, a V pointer table and stuff like that. So you can customize it for what you need. Um, there's a few basic ones that are provided. So there was one that wraps DRM sync object that's just provided for you. Um, and there's a couple of others that are common. Um, or if you need to do your own thing, um, then you can implement it yourself. Like the Intel driver has one that uses a BO as the core synchronization primitive for Windows system integration. Um, but you implement the VK sync primitive and uh, each VK sync type uh, has a set of features and capabilities on it, and then a set of function pointers that, that works with. And it's it, it can optionally support all the things. Um, and then the, the VK fence and VK semaphore are implemented in terms of this. Um, and this allows us to sort of make all that stuff common and, and reason about it at more of a core level than we were before. Um, along with this, we have common QSubmit. So, the way that this works is that instead of implementing VKQ submit yourself, you implement the VKQ driver submit hook. And this takes a struct um, that gets passed in as a pointer, and that contains a set of VK syncs that are your weights and a set of VK syncs that are your signals and all your command buffers. And um, that's what you actually see inside the driver. In the common code, we do a bunch of juggling. We spawn threads behind the client's back if we need to. 
we um, handle all of the annoyance around timeline semaphores. We can even potentially uh, handle CPU work that needs to block. So Lava Pipe these days does not carry its own thread pools anymore. It just sets the bit that says I might block on things and then just executes straight inside of its driver submit hook. And we thread behind the client's back and it still looks like a GPU driver. Um, the Raspberry Pi driver is also taking advantage of this because there's a few places where they have to do stuff on the CPU, which they're going to eventually have to get over that, but for now, it is working. Um, and they're taking advantage of that as well. Um, there, is a, there is a caveat there about sync file export, which I'm not going to go into in detail. Um, and then because we're doing everything in, in the common code, we can also do uh, the idle handlers. Um, the big, the big win that this gave us was dealing with timeline semaphore support. So with timeline semaphores, we're in this annoying situation where we have this cross-process dance that we have to do in order to linearize the dependency graph so that all of the different kernel submit ioctals in all of the different processes get called in a valid order. Um, because timeline semaphore allows, from a client perspective, allows you to do wait before signal where you have one process that waits on a thing and then another process submits the work that's actually going to signal it. And we can't do that in the kernel. And so we have this very careful cross-process dance that ensures that everything gets submitted in the right order. And um, the kernel primitives have all the bits we need for that, uh, but getting that dance actually correct is really tricky. And that's where both Intel and AMD went wrong for a while. And it took us quite a while to get all the bugs out of it, but at this point, I'm pretty sure we're correct. Um, but that's that was the big motivation for the common code is that we've been doing this dance and getting it wrong. And if if me and Boss can't figure it out, I have trouble trusting everybody else. <sighs> um, so the next big one that is really useful for drivers is render passes. Um, so in the in the Tyler space. Render passes potentially provide some benefit because you can um, like combine things together. You can potentially reorder some things. You can do tile merging. Um, in the immediate mode renderer space, which is AMD, Intel, NVIDIA, they provide basically no benefit at all except forcing the application to not do copy commands in the middle of their in the middle of their draw, um, and it kind of forces them to push all the flushes outside of the draw which is a good thing overall for performance, but that's most of what it gains you. And the whole giant multi-sub pass thing is just a pile of code that we all have to type. And so when dynamic rendering came out, which dynamic rendering basically reduces all the render pass stuff down to the 312 model where you still have a render pass that you have to begin and end, and you can't do any copy commands in the middle of it but you don't have this giant structure that you have to create and pass into pipeline creation and that the application has to manage. And s instead of everybody going and implementing two completely different paths in their driver, I went out and built a common render pass implementation that's implemented in terms of dynamic rendering. Um, so right now, Intel and AMD are using it, um, the, uh, and Lava Pipe, I think. Um, I don't necessarily expect the Tylers to, just because, again, render passes theoretically do provide some value there. But for the immediate mode people, there's no point in having them be a, a driver specific thing. So you have to, in order to use it, you have to support dynamic rendering. You have to support um, a pseudo extension that allows us to do layout transition merging with fast clears, which is pretty important for performance on AMD and Intel potentially. Um, in certain cases, it kind of depends on what's going on, but um, so that that is one sort of extension on top. Uh, you have to lower your input attachments, and then you have to provide uh, the feedback loop layout extension, roughly. Um, and then with this, we can implement all of render passes for you in common code, and then you can just drop that whole giant pile. Um, for both RADV and the Intel driver, it ended up being about a net minus 1,500 lines of code. Um, so it's a it's a pretty good code drop, and then we can all just forget about it, and you don't have to think about that inside your driver. Um, again, you can still implement render passes if you want to, which so far the Tylers are doing. Um, although 
Alyssa and I have been scheming about possibly trying to do something common there, but it's a lot trickier on the Tylers if you want decent performance. Um, the other one that's pretty new uh, is graphic state tracking. Currently, nobody is fully using this. Um, basically, there's a new graphics pipeline state object that scoops up all of the pipeline state into a single object. And it's designed to make it a little easy to work with because you don't have to deal with garbage pointers. Um, there's an annoying bit in the Vulkan spec where the application can provide completely invalid non-null pointers under certain circumstances, and we get rid of that for you. Um, but the bigger thing that it does is it handles all of the sort of state accumulation that you need for pipeline libraries. So pipeline libraries, you can specify basically your pipeline in four different chunks. You have a input assembly chunk, you have a pre-rasterization shaders chunk that is all your geometry pipeline, and then you have your fragment shader, and then you have your fragment output chunk, which is basically blending. Um, and, but you still have like a final pipeline at the end, and this deals with all of these splitting up the state and then helping you recombine it later and, and handling all of that. Um, and it also deals with like avoiding the null pointer, ch avoiding invalid pointer chasing, and generally it's nicer to work with than the Vulcan structs themselves. Um, it also deals with extensions for you, so instead of having to chase extension structs, the extended stuff is just in there. And if there is a default value for the unextended version, then if the extension isn't present, you get the default value. So you can just read it, and it's like you're writing Vulkan 1.0 again. You don't have to deal with extensions or think about that. So it makes things a little bit easier. The biggest thing, though, is it helps with pipeline libraries. Um, the other one that I did was uh, the graphics dynamic state, which um, provides helpers for doing CPU side tracking of dynamic state. So right now, everybody has a dynamic state struct. They all have implementations of VK, CMD, set, whatever. They all have a set of dirty bits. They all do the tracking themselves. And this is another couple thousand lines of code that everybody is just copying and pasting for absolutely no good reason. Um, so there is now a VK, graphics, a VK dynamic graphics state struct and help us to work with it. So you can populate it from a pipeline and it will take all the dynamic stuff from the pipeline and put it in there. Um, you can copy them around, you can merge them. Uh, we do dirty tracking and then if you use this mechanism, all of the VKCMD set things are implemented for you. You do not need to have those in your driver. You can just delete that giant pile of code. And again, this is another 1500, 2000 lines depending on how many extensions you've implemented. Um, what you see in the driver is there is a bit set of dirty bits basically split up as per the VKCMD set things. And so you just do if this bit is set or this bit is set or this bit is set, emit the packet. Um, so far, the Intel driver is the only one that's fully converted over to this that's in the tree. Um, I am hoping the AMD people will convert eventually, but I haven't actually gone out and done the typing for them. Um, and they've got pipeline libraries and other stuff in flight, so I don't want to stomp on that. Um, but it's, yeah, basically everybody has been doing this in the driver and there's no reason why we all need to be doing it. Um, originally, when Vulkan was first being designed, the thought was that the CMD set things would actually turn into hardware commands on the spot. But between having to deal with multiple state bits in single packets and doing combining and having to deal with um, like meta commands, which you need to be able to save and restore, so you have to have a shadow copy anyway, and all the other things you have to do in order to actually build a driver. To my knowledge, the only hardware where it's actually practical to do that is NVIDIA, um, and only if you're willing to do some other shenanigans. So it's in practice, it's ended up that everybody has built a dynamic state tracker, and there's no reason why we all have them. Um, the other one that I mentioned briefly at the beginning is uh, meta ops. So Intel does not do any Vulkan meta stuff, but most of the other drivers have gone that direction where they implement copies and blitz in terms of other Vulkan commands inside the driver, and they just save all the Vulkan API state and then call a bunch of stuff on their command buffers. Um, I've been trying to build something that we can do in common code for that. Uh, I've got the core infrastructure, so it can uh, hash and cache pipelines and uh, things and image views and things like that. Um, I've got code to track transient things on the command buffer. So like if you have to create a bunch of image views to do 
copies, then we can track down the command buffer and destroy them when the command buffer gets destroyed. Um, and then the saving or story has to be left up to the drivers because even if you're using the common dynamic stuff, there's still like descriptor sets and other bindings that you need to be able to save from the store. So that's that's still up to the drivers. But hopefully most of most of the infrastructure can be made common. Um, so far, what I have done there is I've got clues working. That probably needs some reshuffling, but I've got most of the stuff needed for that, including a mechanism for allowing, I haven't actually hooked this up in any drivers, but in theory, a mechanism for allowing drivers to use their own custom rectangle primitives instead of triangles if they want to, um, and deleting the geometry part of the pipeline if they want to, or in the case of Tyler's, potentially even doing it as a load up. Um, but it needs to be prototyped in more drivers before I'll be convinced that I've gotten it all right. Um, I've got code for Blitz. Uh, the next one I'm probably going to be working on is Resolves, because I'm going to need that. Um, and then copies haven't been touched. Um, I have been testing. I originally tested by hacking up the Intel driver. I'm now pretty heavily testing things in NVK. Um, and then Alyssa and I have been scheming a little bit to convert to NVK, but neither one of us has worked up the will to actually dig into it. Um, I'm hopeful that this will eventually sort of replace all the driver custom stuff, um, at least where we can. Uh, the The custom should still be able to be done. In fact, I'm hopeful that the custom stuff and this won't actually conflict at all and it'll actually be helpful for that where you can just sort of reuse like the hash and cache that I've built. But um, that's gonna be up to drivers how they want to do that. I know AMD currently is able to compile all of the pipelines that they will ever use at driver boot. That's not practical with this because there's just too many combinations because we have to stick actual formats and things. But hopefully, um, uh, hopefully, at least some of the framework will be useful for that, and we can uh, start trimming down some of the driver custom stuff. Okay, so that's that's most of the stuff I've been doing in the Common Core. Um, now, for time for the fun part of my talk. So. I taught, called my talk, How to Write a Vulcan Driver in 2022, and we've been keeping it kind of quiet, but if you didn't know already, I have actually written a Vulcan Driver in 2022. Um, it's called NVK. I have a shirt. I have stickers. You can all get stickers. Just talk to me, Mark. We have stickers. Um, and it is a brand new, from scratch, Vulcan Driver for NVIDIA hardware. So it's been mostly done by me and Carol Herbst and Dave Early at Red Hat. Um, Dave kind of got us started with some compute support. Um, Carol has done a bunch of miscellaneous things, and then I've been kind of architecting the core of it and, and filling it out. Um, unlike most other Vulcan drivers, I started this one from blank files. So we have not been copying and pasting very much from other Vulcan drivers. We have not been copying and pasting from Nouveau for the most part. Um, we are using the newly released official NVIDIA headers. So about three or four months ago, NVIDIA dropped the source code for their kernel driver. They've also started dropping official headers. Um, and we are using those instead of the reverse engineered Nouveau headers, which has been really nice because now we actually know what all of those unknown packets are, or at least names of them, which is Pretty cool. Um, and my goal for it is for it to eventually become the RADV of NVIDIA hardware and also to eventually become sort of the new reference driver. Um, most of the drivers in Mesa have started by copying and pasting from either Intel or RADV. Um, I am hoping that, I don't know if there's any more hardware to write a driver for, but I'm hopeful that this will become sort of the new one that people copy and paste from. Um, so with that in mind, I have been trying to keep things as clean and well organized as possible. I have been taking full advantage of all of the nifty runtime things. There is no legacy in there anywhere. Um, it's, it's actually a pretty clean code base right now. I know that's not going to last. I'm well aware. I've been an engineer for a while, but at least right now we have a clean code base. <laughs> um, current status. Um, so I have been developing on Turing. Um, I've got a 2060 in my box. 
Carol and Dave have played around with Ampu a little bit. Um, but so far, the current official support is Turing Plus. Um, Carol has patches for getting us part of the way there on Kepler. Um, and later, uh, and it worked and it had reasonable CTS pass rates until I went in and made absolutely everything in the driver rely on the MME and now it doesn't work at all. Um, but hopefully some, I mean, somebody can come in and, and backfill some of that. Um, the biggest blocker is that we're going to need a new kernel API. And um, we're, we're pretty thoroughly um, rewriting a lot of the Nouveau stack in this process. But part of it is that we need a new kernel API because the current one is very old school. And we really need something that allows us to do particularly separate binding and submission because in order to properly implement Vulkan on NVIDIA, we absolutely have to be able to do sparse binding because you have to be able to put information about depth buffers in the page table, which is really annoying. Um, and that just doesn't work with Vulkan sub allocation model unless you can control the page tables from user space. Um, and so that means a pretty substantial surgery to the Nouveau kernel driver. Dave has started working on some of that. Um, Ben might be doing some of that. Um, I have told people that I really badly do not want to do any of that. I don't want to end up as a kernel maintainer. Um, but that that is kind of the big blocker, and it's probably going to be blocking getting NVK merged if we can wait that long. Um, just because I really, really, really do not want to be supporting the old Nouveau kernel API for the next 10 years. Um, I would much rather just get it fixed and get everything landed and deal with the bugs than having to support the old legacy API forever. It's good enough to bring up. Um, we are at about a 98% CTS pass rate with a very basic feature set. There's no tessellation shaders. There's no geometry shaders. Um, there's piles and piles of features that aren't implemented. Um, we're at roughly 20 to 25% of what I would expect to be a final pass rate uh, for a competent driver these days. Um, but we are we are getting there. Um, if people want to uh, test and contribute, it is living in the NVK slash main branch in Nouveau slash Mesa. Um, there are merge requests. We've already gotten some merge requests out from people who are not me, Carol, and Dave. Um, so feel free to, to help out. There's lots and lots of little features that need to be done. There's lots of bu there's probably lots of bugs to fix. Um, the the biggest request is to to be nice to us with the issue tracker. Um, don't file with issues for every single feature that you want to see in the driver. We know that it's missing all the features. Uh, we don't need piles of issues to to know that. Um, also, please don't file games bugs yet because again, we know there are lots of missing features, which means. If your game is running on something like DXVK, it's probably taking very, very bad paths. And we will deal with that once we're actually up to speed and taking the proper paths. But um, so yeah, but feel free to help out if you want. Feel free to play around with it. I did get Windows system integration hooked up this last week, so it will actually draw things on the screen now. Um, that's kind of an important feature, but not actually that important for development, just important for users. Um, Mark is sitting over there with his finger on the button. There's going to be a blog post coming out with more information on the Collabo website. Um, and it will be advertised on uh, Collabo Twitter and my Twitter as well. So with that, um, thank you. And I will take questions. And also, Collabo is hiring. So. I don't think that Mike is working. I can hear you when I'll repeat it, so. Yeah, so that was Lude, I think, I'm, am I pronouncing that right? Yep, uh, saying that she is working on helping Ben get everything reviewed for new API and GSP firmware, which is hopefully also going to get us reclocking. Cross your fingers. Um, <laughs> any other questions? Yeah. 
just just ask up and I'll repeat it. So the question is if the use the headers have useful information um, or is it just names? It is mostly just names, but it's also it's it's not just registered names, it's also field names. And so everything is broken down to, you know, this particular value in this particular register. And that has been really helpful. Um, it's not documentation, but it is a lot better than what we had before, which was a bunch of people guessing what things were called based off of what other drivers poked into them. Um, and so there have been a number of places where it's, oh, so that's what value we're setting there. Because like with Nouveau, there was a bunch of, there was also a bunch of unknown headers, just UNK and then the address number for the register. And it was set to magic value and nobody has any idea what that magic value does. And now we can actually see, oh, that's controlling caches. Oh, that's controlling this bit over here. And so it has been very helpful to have that information. Again, it's not, it's not complete but it is helpful. The other thing that it gives us is it tells us stuff that we're missing because like as people enable hardware, sometimes they miss registers or there's features that we don't know how to hook up. And this gives us, um, they're not complete. There is stuff that is scrubbed out of them, but it does tell us about stuff that we were missing. Like, you know, here's a depth test register over here that nobody knew about that we should probably be setting to a reasonable value. And the way NVIDIA hardware is designed, it's generally um, pretty close to the API. And so between the names and good API specs, we can pretty much figure out what most stuff does. So it's, it's, it's a lot better situation than when we were in before, but it's, you know, it's not quite giant PDFs describing everything. Josh. So was the question was, is there anything interesting in the video kernel release that would be useful for Nouveau? And I think, yeah, um, I'm not a, I haven't been working on it, but I'm pretty sure it's a, pretty much a gold mine in terms of figuring out how to properly program the hardware because kernel is a lot trickier than user space because you don't have this giant API that basically one-to-one -one maps to the hardware that you can look at for how things work. You, you, you're flying blind if you don't have documentation and this at least tells us what's going on and you know how do they load the firmware and then we can try to reverse it out. But so I think that has been very helpful. Um, and I think they've already fixed a bunch of bugs based off of it as well. So yeah, it's been, it's been useful. Again, it would be awesome if they gave us actual PDF docs, but short of that, this is, this is a lot better situation than we were in a year ago. Yeah, so we have some questions uh, from people uh, attending online uh, from Amersho. Uh, what would be a good first task to start contributing to NVK? Uh, so good first tasks, um, there's a lot of stuff in there that is basically like maybe even already hooked up. We just haven't advertised the feature bit with the extension name and it just, or we, or there's maybe like one bit to set somewhere in the hardware. There's a lot of those features. So where I would probably, where I would like to see people start is just sort of going through the zinc checklist because to me that's the next thing to get up and running is to try and see if we can get all the stupid little features that zinc needs they're not stupid they're just they're tiny um and they seem a little bit silly but like there's a lot of features that are needed in order to get that up and going at full speed and that seems like the next sort of milestone to be able to do is to see if we can get a bunch of that running um because that will also pick up a bunch of what dxvk needs but generally all the extensions like we should be able to eventually implement all the things, it's just a matter of one by one turning things on and running the CTS tests and making sure they work. Uh, another question from people attending online, uh, plans, plans for more common code besides meta? Um, plans for more common code? Most of the common stuff has been driven by need and right now I'm not aware of anything else that's a big problem. Um, we do keep finding little things. Um, like the command buffer error tracking. Uh, we also did command buffer state tracking. I don't remember if that one's been merged yet or not. Um, but it's mostly based on need. The big blocks I think are what I listed. Um, but as time goes on, we will probably see more and more things, particularly as Vulkan evolves. Um, a lot of what we're doing in the common code is allowing your driver to 
sort of stay at the bleeding edge and not have to worry about all the trailing stuff behind the bleeding edge. Um, and so that's where like the synchronization two port comes in. That's where render passes come in. Um, and so it's, that's going to depend on what happens in Vulcan as a whole, um, what new stuff comes up. Um, it's a really bad example, but if we decided to implement the rest of the geometry by planetomes of mesh shaders, which I actually don't think is a good idea um, for a number of reasons, that would be something we might attempt. But again, we're not going to do that. That's just an example of new thing, old thing, and doing the mapping. But again, we do that based on whether or not it makes sense, not um, trying to do all of it, because sometimes it doesn't make sense for performance. But the Rendu passes was one case where it definitely did make sense. Um, but yeah, again, it's, it's being driven by what do people find that's duplicated and and where does Vulcan evolve? And I can't really predict that at this point. Okay, so the question was, why are we not using the open source NVIDIA driver? Um, and the short answer is that it's not really in a shape that can be upstreamed. Um, the API is completely unstable. It can potentially change at any moment. Um, it's all based on uh, user space submission directly into firmware, which means that if the firmware changes, again, that's not stable. Um, it doesn't really integrate with the rest of DOM because it's designed to be built across a dozens and dozens of kernel versions, including kernels that are not Linux. Um, so it's just, it's generally not something that we want to drop into upstream in its current form. Um, and it's, I think, questionable whether retrofitting that is actually easier than, than retrofitting what we have, or even possibly replacing what we have. Boss. Uh, am I going to rewrite the compiler too? Uh, yes, I did not put that on the slide, but that's my next project. So um, <laughs> I got a big clap from Martin in the back. So yeah, uh, the the whole Nouveau stack is kind of in the same state where it was state of the art a decade ago when it was first written. And there have been a lot of amazing people that have worked on it over the years. It's just not had the manpower to actually stay up to date. And so it's fallen into disrepair as hardware has been enabled in the fastest and cheapest way possible. And people are just trying to stay on top of it and keep afloat. And so the compiler has had the same problems where um, it's, you know, was state of the art at the time, but these days it's getting pretty crufty. And so, yeah, my next project is the compiler. I'm actually gonna be sort of stepping away from the main driver portion uh, and I'll still be reviewing stuff. I'll be still be helping stuff land. Um, maybe even get a minion to work on some stuff at Collab where we'll see. But the uh, my my focus is going to shift towards the compiler, and my plan is to start from blank files again and pull stuff from the old compiler as needed. But um, we'll see where that goes. I, I think that's probably going to be the solution. Is it's just going to get wholesale replaced? Um, because along with being very, along with being sort of old and, and patched on too, it's also very, it thinks in terms of TGSI in a lot of ways. Um, and slowly refactoring and trying to avoid breaking Nouveau is probably more work than just opening blank files and typing at this point. Um, so I'm also hoping that it's gonna be a, a best practices thing as well, where I'm, hoping to do all of the neat things like SSA register allocation and all of those good things, but we will see how that goes. NVIDIA Hardware is actually pretty darn compiler friendly, so I'm, I've got high hopes. Upstream merge request when? Um, as I said, I do not want to merge a driver that, support, that supports the current Nouveau kernel API. Um, I can post a merge request and leave it as draft status. Um, if people think that that's a nice place, nice way to find it, um, but it's probably going to sit there as a draft for the next four or six months, however long it takes to get the kernel API in shape. Um, because yeah, I don't want to. Again, it's it's not it's not that we can't do any Vulkan. Getting Vulkan actually conformant on the kernel kernel API may not be practical without real nasty hacks, and. 
I definitely don't want to support it for the next 10 years. So I don't want to merge those files. Um, but once the canoe kernel API is in shape, um, yeah, we're going to post the merge request and that will be the user space driven that drives merging the kernel changes. And then we'll land it as soon as that's in shape. So hopefully we'll get it in upstream in, in four to six months is probably the quickest that I could guess, but it's going to depend on how quickly all the Red Hat folks were able to get the kernel in, in place. Other questions? Chad. Um, I work on the package driver Linux, and all the kernel measures are code measures. Is it um, yeah, that was that was Chad who, who works on Venus some, and he's jealous of all of our common helpers. Although, we'll see. We might be able to start using more of them. Hopefully. Uh, so Timo is asking how much overhead the graphic state helpers ha add. And the answer is that I have not solidly benchmarked it. Um, they are more complicated than the ones we had in Intel because they actually check for whether or not the state changes before setting the dirty bits, which costs you more in VKCMD set, but may save you in other places. Um, and so it's it's kind of hard to know whether or not that's actually a win. Um, it does mean, particularly for pipelines, that we aren't resetting every single state when pipelines change. We only set the delta, um, which from the perspective of shorter command buffers and less PCI traffic and less hardware time being spent parsing those command buffers, it's going to be a win on the GPU. Whether or not the check for whether the state changed is on the CPU is going to balance that out, I don't know. I do not have numbers on that. Um, I would love it if somebody got some numbers. Boss. I, I, sorry, I'm having trouble hearing that. Okay, yeah, Rad, uh, Boss is saying that they, they removed a bunch of the comparisons on RADV due to the benchmarks. And it could be that that's better. Part of it is also depends on the hardware because RADV is pretty close to packet for packet in terms of VKCMD set maps to this packet over here. Um, on hardware like Intel or ARM, where that's not the case, and you are recombining for absolutely everything, I think the balance very well may shift. So it's it's not clear to me that there's a clear answer for everybody, which is unfortunate, um, because if we're going to do stuff in common code, we have to pick one. Um, if it really is important for RADV to do them themselves, then they can do them themselves. There's no requirement there. Um, it just means that you know, the meta stuff gets more complicated. So maybe there's a custom uh, Timur is asking if there's room for custom state bits. Um, I don't see why not. Um, there aren't any currently um, because, again, it's been based off of what the API provides. Um, and with Dynamic State 3, that is now basically all of the things. Um, but if you have some bit of state that gets derived in the pipeline and you want to pass it through there, I don't see why we couldn't. Um, it just It's just an enum that we use to index bits in a bit field, so there's very little overhead to adding one. Um, we're currently at 64 bits of bit field. Um, if we go over that to 96, it might add some overhead somewhere, depending on stuff and how well the compiler optimizes, but I don't see why that would necessarily be a problem if somebody needed a, a driver-specific bit. And Arik is tapping his watch, so I think we need to wrap it up. So thank you, everybody. And uh, come talk to me or Mark over there, and you can get an NVK sticker. I've got like 300 of them to hand out. So, um, and yeah, thanks for listening.
Hey everyone, I'm going to talk about ray tracing in Red V. Um, I happen to call it world's slowest ray tracer. Hopefully we're not actually that slow, but I wouldn't be surprised if we come close. Um, I'm going to give you a short intro about what ray tracing actually was again, uh, but not going to talk that much about the API level. Uh, Jason had some good talks in the previous year, so watch those if you want to know more about the API level. Um, but yeah, ray tracing, like in traditional rasterization, like you take a piece of geometry, say a triangle, and you look like, okay, where does that land on my screen? And with ray tracing, you kind of can work the other way around. You pick, pick a ray, for example, the ray you go out of your eye as you see your screen and then see, okay, what geometry would I actually hit? And the fun part is you can do it directly out of the camera, but you can also do more rays. So you could go, for example, hey, I see a person, and then from the hit position on that person, you could go to the sun or another light, and you can do lots more rays, and that gives like way to do way more advanced lighting. And... <clears throat> Yeah, how do you trace a ray? And uh, you could try to check all triangles or all the geometry, and it may be not no surprise that that's going to be pretty slow. Um, so ob obviously, people found a tree structure for this, uh, what we call a bounding volume hierarchy. So basically, you want to try to build a tree out of your geometry, where like every node has a bounding box, so an axis aligned bounding box assigned to it so then if you walk to that tree like and you see hey my ray doesn't intersect with that bounding box i don't need to look at the subtree and that can speed up things a lot it turns out that typically doesn't make it fast enough for for real-time usage say in games yet so a lot of vendors have been looking at hey can we do a part of this in hardware so we can actually use it in games and I'm going to look at, hey, uh, AMD has RDNA 2 now, which has a bunch of hardware acceleration, which we've been working on with RAD-V on enabling. So how do we do this in, on AMD hardware? And there's basically a single instruction that gets added. You have a, a node in your tree, and you can see, does it intersect with the array? And it does provide some nice bits, like um, if it's an internal node, uh, we, it basically try, it returns, hey, which of the children does it hit? And it gives you their IDs in a sorted manner. So like you get a nice benefit of looking for the closest hit first. And in the triangle node, it like pre-computes the bare center coordinates. But overall, it's just, hey, we process a single node, nothing more, nothing less. And with that comes a bunch of like predefined hardware nodes. So uh, every vendor is different in this. Uh, we have a triangle node which actually can contain five vertices and we can do four triangles based on pointer tagging in the low bits of the address of the nodes. Um, same pointer tagging is used by the way to distinguish between internal nodes and triangle nodes. And then we have uh, internal nodes, uh, both 32-bit float and 16-bit float variants. So we have four child and per node, and min and max bounds per child. And yes, as I said, it returns those. And my understanding is that roughly like it can do one node per compute unit per, uh, comp uh, per cycle. And with triangles, that means only one triangle. You can't test all five, of, all four of them at once, sadly. Um, yeah, so how to trace a ray in RDNA 2? And the answer is basically just the software answer, and we replace the tiny, the bit that actually checks for the collision with this hardware instruction. But otherwise, like the tree walk all happens in shader code. So we basically have a bunch of giant near builder code of like a couple hundred lines that's, uh, yes, I, I, I see someone laughing here. I think at this point, the near builder for all our ray tracing is like by far larger than all our other meta stuff combined. 
So uh, we, we've been taking some care recently to move at least a lot of the older stuff, not the ray tracing itself, to GLSL. Uh, we already had the GLSL and, uh, dependency because of the HUD that was included in MESA for Vulkan. So that was an easy add. Uh, but yeah, we just do a uh, depth first search. And of course, a depth first search, you either need a stack or you need um, some uh, backtracking. And backtracking, like we have four thousand per internal node. So it, and it's sorted. So we don't have a predefined order of visiting things. So if you backtrack, you need to figure out, hey, what's the next child? And with the sorting, it turns out the easiest way to go to the next child is uh, to uh, do the intersection test again and just get the next child of that list. The problem with that is now do you, you're doing 2x the intersection test. So ideally, we'd keep with the stack. We have two options for the stack on AMD hardware because like requirement is basically you want independent indexing per invocation so you can't do it on registers. So we have VRAM and we have LDS which is our version of shared memory. So no surprise LDS tends to be faster memory but of course when we do that we hit occupancy limits of like this loop is going to be very memory instruction heavy, memory instructions have high latency you want latency hiding, but if you use a ton of uh, shared memory space or a ton of registers, you can only run so many shaders per compute unit. So like you can't do any latency hiding. So like if you actually experiment with the number of stack entries, like if we want to cover like the full depth of a perfectly balanced tree, we would need 79 uh, stack entries. And that's like half the performance of only using 16. So obviously we want to use 16, except that's basically using it is not going to be good for correctness, which tends to be a requirement. Um, so what we kind of do is a mix short stack plus backtracking. So 16 entries in the stack, and then we backtrack if we underflow, or, so, and we try to keep the most active 16 entries in the stack. So like the top of the stack is where you're most active. So we just like, as we grow, need to grow the stack, like we just drop stuff under out of it. And then we notice, hey, we've dropped stuff under out of it before we start backtracking. And some benchmarks uh, show that like, now we have to backtrack like less than 1% of the iterations which seems to be pretty decent overhead wise. And uh, the bonus is we have absolutely no debt limits on our uh, BVH tree. Like previously I said 79 for like your perfectly balanced th uh, tree. Um, depending on how you build your BVH, like there's no guarantee on your debt at all that's useful uh, unless you do interesting things. Um, and because this is a single instruction, we could actually just implement that instruction in yet another bit of near builder and get uh, legacy GPU support. I think this basically works on all GPUs that Red V supports. Um, some of them may not be particularly useful. Things will run on your Vega APU uh, laptop, but it won't be pretty. Um, and Roughly half perf is actually not too terrible. Uh, actually shows nicely like what kind of benefit we get from the hardware acceleration. And then next step is building a BVH. Like um, as you might have surmised, like basically any tree we can make a BVH out of just by calculating bounding boxes. Um, but that doesn't mean it's a good BVH. Like if every bounding box is basically your entire scene, it's going to be totally useless for making your ray trace faster. And that's roughly what we did. We just took the geometry in API order and then just linearly added in layers the nodes, which uh, probably is the worst BVH building method out there. It's pretty nice because, hey, it guarantees that it's perfectly balanced. 
it guarantees that um, it, it's very easy to do because like it isn't really dependent on the data, only on the number of nodes. So you can basically say, hey, I, I do these layers in independent compute dispatches. I know how many layers I'm going to have and then just a, a barrier in between them and I'm going to build everything. Uh, so it's, it was pretty easy to code. Um, of course, surprise, surprise, this doesn't pass CTS. And a great example is like if you have two things next to each other, which are on completely opposite see, sides of the scene, you just get a maximum bounding box and you get to visit all the geometry anyway. Uh, which ends up pretty badly. Uh, so we actually ended up uh, sorting the triangles first before building the tree. So uh, like on the center of the bounding box of the triangle. And now you might ask, how do we sort? Well, Morton codes. Um, some of you might re actually remember this from uh, your texture tiling, where it's a pretty common technique. So if we have multi-dimensional coordinates, and yes, we need integer coordinates. You can do that by like taking the fraction of the bounding box of the total scene. Um, and then we can interleave those bits in a way that you kind of get an octree like behavior in the bits when you sort. And just that sorting actually results in something that, that doesn't time out your GPU when uh, you do stuff. So that is the BVH building code that's currently upstream in Mesa for RedV. Uh, it's kind of for people that are more familiar with BVH, this kind of like a linear BVH, uh, poor man's linear BVH, because we don't do the tree building part of it. Um, and we actually see that it's significantly worse than what's possible. So I've been playing around with profilers with a decent set of older drivers for this hardware. Uh, we're lucky to have that. And what you can see is that roughly we visit two and a half as many nodes as a competing driver, uh, which like no matter how good we make our traversal loop, that's uh, not going to uh, beat them. So we've been working on like uh, optimizing this and getting stuff in. And uh, as I said before, like a big part of this is you really don't want these complicated algorithms in near builder. So we've been uh, uh, moving this over to GSLN and we have some experimental stuff. It's not ready for prime time yet as we currently, most of it is very experimental and limited in parallelization of the algorithm. So you can like, that's also bottleneck how expensive is it to build this as potentially part of it, you do every frame and, and stuff. So, um, we actually get pretty close. Like I tried out two algorithms and we have implementations that get roughly within 15% of the iterations. Um, obviously needs to land. And uh, surprise, surprise, we're not the only one who built BVHs. Uh, Intel has a uh, code to build BVHs in their upstreaming of uh, ray tracing support. And Jason did a whole talk last time about how they had this interesting thing of basically doing logic in command buffers. And sad to say we can't on AMD. Our command buffers are fairly limited. And recently, actually like I think two weeks before this talk, uh, AMD open sourced their stuff. Um, and we actually had a big discussion about this because obviously it's very suitable for hardware because it's the same hardware. Um, it's written in HLSL. Uh, it looked like they had some initial bits to compile the HLSL with uh, GSLang, which would have made it an obvious choice, like try to hook it and verbatim. Obviously, we figured out that wasn't possible, uh, mainly because GSLang just sucks as HLSL. Uh, it's very incomplete and the recommended path these days is to use DXC. And then we went to a bunch of people and asked like, hey, is DXC actually an appropriate dependency for Mesa? And the consensus seemed to be no. So uh, that limits things. And then you have the consideration of we could try 
moving this to GSL, but then you get like, hey, obviously, if you're going to rewrite this in another language, there's going to be bugs. If you're going to rewrite this, then people don't actually know the thing they're working on. So they need to build that, like, we might as well uh, do something ourselves. I feel we walked in the not invented hair trap very, very easily here. Uh, then again, I don't see any great other way at this point. And then I'm going to talk a bit more about the API side. Like I talked all about ray tracing and how to build the BV8 and not talking about how an app uses it. Um, so yeah, how to trace rays. There's actually two Vulkan extensions for it. The easy one just provides you a GSL object, a ray query X, and then you initialize it with the ray and some parameters and then you say, trace me a ray, it can return uh, in the middle of it. So, so like for non-opaque objects, you can do stuff like, for example, hey, if I want alpha-based transparency in like plants or something, you can decide, hey, do I want to skip this intersection or not? And then in the end, you get some results uh, in the objects, which is like API-wise, fairly simple. We have a shader loop that we have in near builder, we can just, hey, take every call of trace array and insert that near builder code in here and we're done. Very, very easy. Now the messy part. Um, there's another ray uh, extension that, uh, that's about ray tracing pipelines. And the idea here is that instead of just doing it synchronously, basically we work with callbacks. So like, uh, there's a ray gen shader at the root, like which is a new shader stage it calls trace ray and then when it hits a triangle it go it's going to call a new shader for the hit it, and um, you have a binding table so we don't have one stage of every type we have a lot of them like you can have a ton of uh, stages and then you create a pipeline and then after you created the pipeline, you can get a descriptor for all of your stages, and then you can create a binding table out of them. And what you can do is, for example, uh, the binding table gets indexed on like, for example, the, your geometry ID. So you, this is how you can do like a different shader for like different materials if you hit different geometry. Um, and to make things more complicated, it supports recursion. We all love recursion on GPUs. Um, so Intel had this pass for their ray tracing support that's lower shaders in near to continuation passing style. Um, so like if you have a trace ray, you uh, add the shader there, do some spilling and stuff, and then have a new resume shader for after the trace ray finishes. Uh, so here's an example, um, like, like you, you split it into the first part, you push all the variables that live across onto the stack. Like we use scratch, uh, in, in practice, that's just another region of VRAM that we also use for like spilling registers and stuff like that in our compiler, push the shade ID of re resuming. And then next shader is the trace ray shader and then at the end of it, at the resume, like we pop everything off and set the next shader from uh, popping stuff off from the stack. And then we do the big uh, loop and switch case on the shader ID. Um, so like we do all these callbacks and we win nothing by it. Ex es essentially, um, we get to push a bunch of stuff to a stack, which is free RAM. Uh, we have a big switch, which in near a switch ends up being essentially a bunch of if and else because there's no native switch. Um, and that's what we have. And this is not meeting expectations. This is the biggest blocker by we're not saying, okay, ray tracing is fully done. Uh, that's because uh, ray tracing also has pipeline libraries uh, because of course you don't know all the materials at all uh, uh, at the front of things. So you want to add materials later. And of course, pipeline libraries come with the idea that you actually compile your stuff when the pipeline library is created and not when the final pipeline is created. 
Um, that doesn't work well with that central big loop with switch because we compile everything when the pipeline is compiled. And that results in huge stutters and stuff. So ideally, so we have an indirect branch instruction uh, that we'd like to use, uh, but we need to um, do a bunch of echo work for this. The nice part about the previous approach of just doing the big loop and switch is this didn't need any echo changes at all. It was basically all in there. Um, and then yeah, the problem with any kind of control flow is it's still a SIMD machine. So it was kind of implicit, but like you have a huge uh, potential for divergence, like because you can only execute one kind of uh, one shader at a time. So if every lane has a different uh, shader, that's going to be messy and you're going to be not very efficient. And then we can compile things separately, but this needs echo changes, not only for the indirect branch, but we also did a lot of optimizations like, hey, only include certain bits in your shader ABI if they're actually used. But now because you're calling an unknown shader, you don't know what's actually used. Um, so that's what we're working on. And then now, what's the current status? So ray queries are enabled by default. That was the simple option. And ray tracing pipelines are uh, behind the uh, environment variable. All right, reperf test equals RT. As said, separate compilation is kind of the main blocker there. And we have a couple of working games. Uh, Quake RTX is a Simple demo, we have control, we have that loop. Uh, I hear Resident Evil Village works and Metro uh, Exodus. Um, okay, I might have that wrong. I think it's Enhanced Edition. And sorry, um, works. Uh, there's also a bunch that doesn't work, like uh, Doom Eternal runs, but doesn't have the reflections right. And there's a whole bunch of uh, DXR 1.1. So DXR is the directory the equivalent and like there's a 1.0 and the 1.1 version and we don't have all the feature uh, Vulcan features for 1.1. So there's a whole bunch of more recent ray tracing games that we don't support yet. Um, performance wise. So I have benchmarks here. Uh, I, I'll take MDDPU as the baseline here. And we actually see that upstream as of now is very bad, hitting about 40% of the performance. Um, and experimental, so experimental is with a better BVH build. Um, we're getting much closer, 60 to 70%. And funny part here is that MD feel okay, so that's kind of MD GPU Pro with LVM instead of their proprietary compiler is much slower than AMD GPU Pro as well. So in the Ray Query path, we actually get quite close within 10%. Um, so obviously there's still a bunch of work to do here. And Radi we have integration with Radian Race Analyzer. So this is a tool from AMD that uh, basically allows you to visualize your BVHs and look at, hey, what are expensive parts of your scene and not. and this is actually pretty cool to see how poor BVHs are. Um, or at least I made this one with uh, the experimental BVH builder. And we actually had two new contributors who kind of came out of nowhere and did really uh, cool stuff like the Radian Race Analyzer integration or the Ray Query implementation. So uh, they've been pretty active and I'm very happy and thankful for that. And then what comes next? Yeah, so on the feature side, separate shader compilation is a big thing because then we can enable ray tracing by default and indirect BVH uh, builds. So where like a lot of the parameters also come from like a GPU buffer that's not known at recording time, which is needed for DXR 1.1. Uh, performance wise, we need a uh, better BVH building. We need to land that. Um, like I said in the notes uh, overview, like we can do multiple triangles per node and 16-bit uh, flo uh, floating point uh, node bounds, which we're totally not using at all. So we can do a lot of more optimization there. Although initial benchmarking has shown that that's 
likely less than a 5% improvement in ray tracing performance. Uh, Micro-optimize micro the hell out of the transversal loop even more. I mean, it's a pretty tight loop. I think we're doing about 17, uh, 70 factor ALU instructions per iteration right now. Um, so, and I'm trying to remove every one of them. And then optimize it. So the main loop, like for the callback structure, we haven't really optimized at all. And there's ideas we could do there. Like we could find duplicate shaders or resume shaders. Like I expect a lot of them will, for example, hey, we do a trace ray and nothing after. So we really didn't need to split the thing. We can just uh, call and then go jump two stack frames at once, for example, uh, or tail calls. Um, that kind of stuff uh, would be a pretty nice thing. And yeah, AMD has announced uh, or, or announced that they will announce their next generation of GPUs uh, later this year. So who knows what's interesting new uh, ray tracing features that will bring that we can integrate in this process. Let's just hope I don't have to rewrite everything again. And that was it. Thank you all. Any questions? Jason? Uh, for what? For yeah. So, so for for the stack indices in the BVH walk, have I considered um, using uh, thirty two bit indices? Okay, so so the question ha is like whether I've considered using two bits uh, indices in my stack. Uh, so, so that was a consideration. We found several papers also about like essentially like restarting your search like once you flow out of your search stack. Um, so so the main consideration there to not do it was uh, because then we still like even though the space is much smaller, you still have a limited stack depth. And most of the algorithms we found for like building a BVH had no consideration for the depth at all. So we thought like it would be a way easier integration if this was something we just didn't have to worry about. And like, like when you have those two bit indices, you're still kind of dealing with the e either restart or backtracking. So like you still, you still want a short stack in combination with that. That's like a normal stack. Uh, so, so that would be pretty similar. Alisa? Um, I actually don't know, do I su suspect not, uh, not the most important point right now. <laughs> oh, right, yes. So uh, with the uh, ray tracing pipelines, how bad is this for the instruction cache? And I don't know, I haven't benchmarked it, but I suspect it's not our most pressing issue right now. It, it does result in huge shaders though. Like I, I think one of the few games that we have not working is because uh, of a compiler crash because the shader is too big. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, so the question was uh, whether, like, it, it, like having worked with BVH is a lot. The idea was always to do bread first and then batch a lot and. Uh, a bunch of things like API limitations make it hard to batch here. Um, so, so we haven't done that. And, and then like bread first does result in a ton of memory bandwidth that makes it not worth it. Like if you can't batch. Uh, so I, 
I think that's what it mostly comes down to. Um, it's one of the big limitations here that like we have no great har hardware options to like, um, especially in the ray tracing pipeline, like you saw Intel who has like great hardware on like when you have lots of different things, like we change things between different work groups and stuff like that. And we have no great options there. So like we need a bunch of software machinery that we have to try to get fast. Um, to move things around, which is going to be a big limitation also with uh, like pr avoiding divergence in, in things. So I'm still looking for options there. It's not our most pressing issue right now. Like a couple of games I checked, like the active lanes for the uh, ray tracing, like at the start of the ray trace are about 80%, which is not too bad. Uh, but it's definitely a concern, uh, especially as you go more and more indirect rays. Yes. So I, I t okay. Uh, so the question was whether. Uh, like how much of BVH building is uh, like finished research and just implementation or whether there's actually stuff to look at. And I, I think it's a combo. So BVH builds like at its core is um, like fairly well researched. There are a ton of papers on the field, though there's a bunch of like details about like, hey, you have a split BVH because you have this two level acceleration structure and and there's stuff like that, that we can do like, like, like there's the te theory and there's the, like, what kind of stuff can we tweak to actually make this the fastest thing possible. Uh, but, but yeah, we're mostly still in the, let's get an algorithm implemented correctly. Uh, the follow-up question is why Kronos left the BVH building up to the uh, driver rather than the application developer. So I have two speculative answers that I'm saying because I don't want to say anything Kronos and then Jason can probably talk about the Kronos things afterwards. So first things first, uh, the BVH format is hardware specific. So like you, you don't really know. Second thing is uh, we want direct 3D uh, hardware and software compatibility and that does it the other way. Um, but those are my speculation. I, I see Jason nodding, so I'm assuming I got it. Okay, so to repeat, Jason, like, like he basically confirmed that yes, it's going to be hardware specific at Kronos did it feel like locking it down just yet as it saw more evolvement in the space for now. And yeah, we have a question from the live audience. Uh, how difficult has it been to debug issues in RT shaders? Uh, and have you discovered any useful tips or tricks? And have I, we discovered any? Uh, any useful tricks or tips? Um, it's been pretty hard, um, mainly because uh, like a lot of it is very indirect. Uh, currently, we don't have a lot of experience with it. Mostly the games that worked are games that worked when we implemented all the features. Um, there's been a bunch of things. Uh, a big limiter there though is that render docs doesn't support ray tracing at this point. So like when we want to debug something, like we basically have to do our own custom dumping of what we think it should do. Um, 
experimentally, I want to try using something like gradient race analyzer to see part of it. And then if we can maybe dump race or something, uh, that would be nice. But um, yeah, that just needs a whole bu uh, bit of dumping. Uh, and to make dumping easier, uh, Hans Christian on the VKD3D site implemented a bunch of dumping that I want to port over to RADV, which I think is roughly a shader print uh, uh, kind of thing. Uh, and if we have that reusable, it would be way nicer to reuse that as we debug uh, different bugs. Any other questions? Then let's leave it here. Thank you all.
Hello. Hi. Hello. Hi, yes. Uh, I'm Melissa. Lena is here with me. Uh, okay, she's not physically here with me, but uh, good, good enough. Uh, everybody say hi to Lena. She can see you. Hi. You should all, this should all be sufficient proof that I'm not Lena, as people keep claiming. Um, I mean, I could have pre-recorded her, I suppose. No response to that? Yeah, that's fair. All right. And this is Tasting the Forbidden Apple. <laughs> Might be a little problem with the magic. Uh, Magic's a, little, a very fickle thing. Uh, anyway, uh, the, this, I would like to start off the, to the talk with a little note about the status of the Asahi driver for the Apple M1 GPU, uh, otherwise known as the AGX architecture or the G13 GB0 architecture, if you really like letters and numbers like I do. Um, and so where were we last year? Let's see. Last year, uh, we had the driver was upstream in Mesa, uh, which meant that we could do some basic OpenGL ES2, uh, app a little bit of the, conf the conformance suite, no actual applications, and all of this was running on macOS, which already has a driver stack, so not very useful. I mean, it was useful to me, <laughs> um, but and passing about 95%, so very much prototype code, not a real driver, but uh, got the essentials there. So where are we now? Let's find out. Uh, Almost passing for ES2, about 90% through ES3. And uh, yeah, Ella uh, has been, f from uh, V3D fame, has been starting work on a Vulcan driver. So uh, making progress on things. Anyhow, uh, the main thing I want to talk about is getting it right and getting the driver right. Uh, and this is not my first driver in Mesa. I have, uh, did the Panfrost driver for a number of years, uh, continue to work on that. Uh, and I have learned a lot of hard lessons of how not to write a driver for, from Panfrost. And as much as uh, talks like Jason's uh, with exciting titles, like how not to write a backend compiler or how to write a Vulkan driver, you'd think I would have learned from them. But, you know, this might be a vain effort, but here's how not to write an OpenGL driver. Um, so the first thing I want to talk about is register allocation, especially given that uh, Daniel and Connor are out here in the audience, uh, who I owe a great, de great, great debt of gratitude to. Um, on, on the Apple GPU, uh, the, the, it matters a lot how many registers you use. Uh, the occupants, the, if you used more registers, occupancy will suffer, uh, performance will suffer. It's and there's not a single threshold. It's not you know half or full like it is on Molly. There are uh, many gradations of numbers of registers that you could use versus thread count. So we really want to be conservative with the number of registers. And spilling is of course very expensive. Uh, as at the end of the day, uh, as much as it gets, uh, as much as this is a very large system. Uh, it's still a mobile GPU. I mean, you can dress it up in as many Pro Max Ultra Extreme Super Cool Awesome words as you want. It is. This is. This is a mobile GPU. <laughs> um, so the state of the art is to uh, do register allocation uh, it, it, while you are still have a program in static single assignment. Uh, form and so the state of the art in Mesa is going to be the IR3 IR3 driver for Fredrino and the ACO compiler uh, for uh, for the AMD hardware. The problem, as I learned the hard way, is that you can't retrofit uh, this adult level register allocator into your driver, or at least you can, but it's very painful. Uh, ACO was designed this way from the start, as far as I know, uh, so I ha skipped that problem entirely. IR3, sorry? Um, okay. Um, IR3 did retrofit, but b at the time of retrofitting the, uh, the new register allocator, there was not existing spilling support, so a lot less of a differential to deal with. When I look at something like Molly, where we already have a production driver that does spilling and does uh, allocation, does all the all the good stuff, and now suddenly think, you know what I really need? I need more static single assignment form. And then you end up in, in a hole with private branches that are thousands of lines different to upstream and will, at this rate, may never be landed because it's not good enough yet, even though it's 
better and that's just not a fun hole to be in so we don't want to be there so what do we do we do a static single assignment form from day one uh this is the tree scan algorithm it's based uh roughly on the ideas from echo and ir3 i will not be going into detail for that if you want if you want to see that look at the excellent talk by daniel and connor from last year um at this point the basic stuff is working uh, i have managed to crib a little bit of code from ir3 most of it i have not been able to just because of differences in how the uh, the compilers are designed but uh we're getting there so happy on there another problem one that i've also hit the seen the hard way and also failed to see the light from the far wiser people in this room um was uh, how you deal with uh, representing image layouts in the driver. Uh, for, in many cases, it's very tempting to make your driver just always do linear textures and linear frame buffers, and I'll deal with performance later. Uh, that does not work when you have hardware like AGX, which literally does not support linear f uh, frame buffers for any but for anything other than like Windows system integration. Uh, so we have to do the t we have to use twiddling or tiling from the start and th the pattern for doing the twiddling is very complicated and very easy to get subtly wrong and that's even for just regular block based for regular formats when you include block based compression especially the arm scalable texture compression which does not even necessarily have power of two block sizes you can have you know five by five block sizes oh well uh, a lot of ways to screw up your screw things up uh, it's easy to pass your test, but it's not actually work. Not, not ideal. So how do we solve it? The same way people smarter than I have solved it with the, uh, ISL, with an ISL like library for Intel, uh, NIL for the, uh, NVK driver, which you heard about this morning. Uh, you have having a dedicated library that only is concerned with laying out services, not allocating the memory, just determining the layout. Uh, it turns out this matters a lot, and it means you can actually worry about correctness in the place that counts. Because it, you think, oh, well, you just multiply stride by height, and that's your size, but that doesn't work when you have all of these complicated details to worry about. And the formula get very subtle with lots of little edge cases. And if you try to open code this in your driver, as every driver has tried, uh, in many cases you get it wrong. And for AGX, certainly we got it wrong. So we... Uh, we have the AIL library with the garlic mascot. Um, this is a complete clone of ISL because I, as I've learned every time I try to be clever and be smarter than the people in this room, I realize that the people in this room are smarter than me and I should have listened to the adults in the first place. Uh, so uh, yeah, the way ISL does it, you use unit suffixes for everything, which means you get dimensional analysis uh, working. You get no more bugs where you should have divided by block size or maybe multiply by block size. Who knows? It's shrug. It's all pixels, right? And no, that's not all pixels. Um, and you unit test everything. And because there's no allocation, it's very easy to have, you know, a thousand unit tests for uh, that are just generated from actual hardware behavior or known good driver behavior. And so that's means you can be very sure of correctness in a way that you're just not going to get from running a small sample of conformance tests or applications. So this is all in all what I feel is a good idea and would highly recommend if your driver does not abstract out image layouts already, you should do that. Uh, and also just much more subtly or puzzly, I guess, there's a lot of best practice in Mesa and again, I have tried to be very creative in the past, and every time I do something clever, I regret it afterwards and le learn I should have just done the thing that everybody else in Mesa already did in the first place. And you can't really go back on your decisions. And I know there's nothing sacred in tree, but refactoring is just pain, and I just don't just don't have pain. Uh, it's very very simple philosophy. Yes. Uh, so again, for the AGX driver, we are trying to follow all the all the things that Mesa has learned over the years and that I have painfully learned uh, over the years. Uh, Gen XML from day one, instead of having bit fields, uh, th the weird three space indentation that everybody has for reasons I don't understand, but uh, if you don't do it, then you can't copy code around and I uh, baffles the mind. Um, and getting the UAPI right, which is actually not my, my department, but uh, I think I know whose department it is.
Lena seems very happy to hear about that. Uh, but, but before we get there, I uh, want to just talk about what's coming next for, the, for my part and Mesa for this driver, namely all of the good stuff from GL3 the, and, or GLS3 that will uh, is needed for Vulkan and needed for apps right now. For example, compute shaders and multiple render targets. M multiple render... I should have maybe put these on the same line because for some reason that, uh, again, baffles the mind, um, these are connected on AGX. Um, remember when I said that AGX is a tiny little mobile GPU that's just, you just add, you know, crazy Pro Max extreme words after the end of it? Yeah, so that means it's a, tile, it's a tiler with a tile buffer and has a very small tile buffer, 32 kilobytes. Uh, and which means if you have lots of data per pixel, you have to have very small tile sizes. Uh, a tiler like Molly can solve this very easily. Uh, the driver calculates the tile size based on uh, how much data you need per pixel. So if you use, if you have absolutely massive pixels due to, you know, eight render targets and multi-sampling and 32-bit and float formats, well, the driver will just use four by four tiles and performance will suffer, but uh, it still works conceptually. How does this work in AGX? Well, conceptually the same, but you only get three tile sizes to choose from, 32 by 32, 32 by 16, and 16 by 16, which if you do the math of 16 by 16 uh, versus a 32 kilobyte tile buffer, uh, you very quickly realize that you do not have enough space to do the, the API requirements for the Kronos APIs. Scratch that, you don't even have enough for metal. Um, there is a corner case on the metal driver for this chip where if you use too large of a tile size or too many bytes per tile, uh, the driver, Apple's driver uses what's called large MRT, large multi-render target mode. And this is a very fancy way of saying that it just stops pretending to be a tiler and it starts pretending to be an immediate mode renderer. And in the fragment shader, it will start storing, spilling uh, to a linear image in memory uh, and re loading back from a linear image in memory for blending. And, uh, okay, well, we can't actually use linear images because we need to still have the frame buffer compressions. So that doesn't really work. So, oh, I know. We'll, do, we'll write out the tile buffer and then we'll load back the linear image into the tile buffer and then write out the tile buffer again a second time. And the second time, so we get to get compression both times. That's why it'll be fast. Great work, Apple. Excellent design. And... Speaking of excellent designs, uh, this excellent design will soon be coming to Linux. And I will now turn it over to Lena, who should be all too happy to tell you about that uh, exercise. Ah! That's with you. Audio good, video good, all good. All right, um, so yeah, once upon a time there was um, a very We lost your audio. Still don't have your audio. Why was that? That didn't make any sense. Uh, we can. Okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Can you hear me now? Are we good? Yes. No. Yep, we are good to go. We're good. Yes. Okay. Sorry about that. Uh, all right. So, once upon a time, there was a very scary, magical and um mysterious black box and then that, that black box was the amon gpu and so oh, i'll see what happens sorry and that guy and i talked to, to the amon gpu um in a strange magical language that we couldn't understand but you know thinking through about it what can we do about this well why don't we put a hypervisor on mac os and so we did, and using this hypervisor, um, we were able to uh, slowly understand the magical language that Nakamura spoke to the GPU, and uh, with its wonderful um, magic ring buffers, and all of its crazy structures, and its pointers, the pointers, the more structures, the more pointers. And so we have this uh, interesting hypervisor that um, uses a strange and bizarre language called Python, and in Python, we can write scripts that let us interpret this magical language. These are scripts in parcel tongue. Something like that. And uh, so uh, with a lot of work, we 
we can get uh, some tech bit where we can run macOS and uh, see every render command and all the structures and pointers to structures and more structures that are involved. And this is super nice. And we can uh, slowly figure things out that way. Um, also, by the way, this is a single 3D render command and it's 730 lines of um, structure. Uh, but uh, anyway, you know, now we have um, all these structure definitions by these structure definitions in Python, and uh, they look kind of like this, which is pretty convenient and easy to write. And uh, so I had an idea. Now that we have all of these nice definitions in Python to parse and read these structures from memory that NetOS writes, what happens if we add more Python and instead of parsing and reading these structures, we generate these structures and uh, we can write a GPU driver in Python. And so we did. And after the first magic ex um, experiment, we were um, rendering triangles. And a little bit later, we were um, pulling rabbits out of our heads. Uh, but, you know, could, could we go a little bit deeper? Could we um, throw even more magic into this little um, experiment? Why? Why don't we try putting Python into Mesa? I will happy now I did not merge this code. This is definitely a great idea. Um, why don't we um, embed a Python interpreter into DR and Shim, and then we can run the entire IGX Python prototype driver in process in Mesa, and it will talk in its wonderful language to the M1 over this strange protocol called USB 2.0 at a breathtaking 480 megabits per second, copying all dirty buffer objects back and forth every single frame. Come on, this is an awesome idea, and you know it. Uh, but yeah, we tried that, and it worked. It worked. So your stream is keep running on a separate host machine, Intel-based, and it's using regular Mesa with a SS driver and a um, you know, prototype UAPI. But it talks to the RM shim, which embeds a Python interpreter, which embeds the entire AGX driver, uh, which then talks over USB to the M1, which renders everything, and it can uh, then copies the frame buffer to the HDMI frame buffer. And displays it in a file. And it's not just game as cute. I was able to get, you know, TTD working in my hotel at about um, 0.5 FPS. Uh, but yeah, it works. Um, so, how, how complicated is this GPU driver? Uh, um, if we look through the code, uh, I think 91 structure definitions in the entire driver. Not very um, simple. And the worst part is that if you get it wrong, if you get any of this wrong, the framework just crashes. At least we get nice crash them, so come on. And, you know, if any of the pointers are wrong, the framework crashes. There's no bounce checking, so if any numbers are wrong, the framework crashes. There are some asserts, and also just make it panic. And the worst part is that the framework is loaded by iBoot, which runs. That's Apple code that runs before our code runs. And so there's no way to reload the firmware because it has a data section. Um, and so the firmware crashes. The only way to fix it is to reboot the entire machine, which is terrible. Well, this sounds like a great design to me. We should all go okay. do things the way Apple does them. You know, uh, so what do we do about this? What could we possibly do to make it practical? to write a GPU driver for this architecture, and it is actually going to work. Why don't we write the driver in Rust? You see, uh, Rust is magic because it can represent all those GPU pointers um, as type pointers, and it can give them lifetime bounds so that um, it checks the compile time that all your GPU objects live as long as the, um, uh, sorry, all the GPU objects live as long as the objects that point to them. And uh, so we can use all of this magic, kind of these magic spells to tie parent objects, the child objects. And um, when all of this is set up, the cleanup is just magic. Um, when Rust drops something, it will drop the um, child structures at the right time. And so the compiler checks all of this and will stop you from breaking the rules so that the firmware doesn't crash. It's great. It's amazing. So here's a, a little example of how that works. We have a raw module which contains structures that represent 
actual GPU memory um, that are shared with the firmware. And so in this case, we have a notifier structure that is in charge of telling the firmware when we want it to notify us of a event like a render completion. And so in this case, that notifier has a pointer to another structure, which is a threshold. And so we represent that with a type called GPU pointer. And you will notice that there is a lifetime there, the apostrophe A. And so that means that the threshold object has to live at least as long as the notifier object. And then um, later outside the raw module, we declare a separate structure also called notifier. Um, but this one actually represents the CPU side, um, you know, metadata or whatever state we need to keep um, to talk about this notifier. And in this case, um, that includes the actual threshold object, the um, GPU object structure that represents, um, you know, ohms and represents the actual allocation and everything related to that threshold object in terms of um, rest on the CPU. And then we have a GPU struct implementation for that notifier, which ties together the two structures, the raw one and the outer one. And in this case, it uses a generic associated type. So it passes through that lifetime, which means that the implementation of all the magic uh, behind the scenes can use that to tie the lifetimes of the objects together. And uh, this is how this works. Uh, we have a um, allocator here, and uh, that is going to allocate a new notifier object. And if you focus on these two bits, you'll see that first uh, we create the CPU side notifier object, and that has the threshold, which is also just allocated as a default. Um, but also then there's a callback after that, um, that is um, that gets a uh, closure passed to it. And that closure um, takes two parameters, the inner um, structure that we just created, the notifier, the CPU side, and a pointer to the GPU side structure that is about to be um, populated. And so we have some uh, magic um, placement stuff here, uh, which I can talk about later if you want. Uh, but the important part is that when we actually uh, instantiate this raw notifier, we give it a GPU pointer that is obtained from the inner structure um, and the threshold member from there. And you can't see it in this part of the code, but because of the way the lifetimes are set up, this only works if you actually use a GPU pointer from the notifier that is um, that is contained that, is, that contains that threshold. So if you try to use a GPU pointer from somewhere else, from some other random object, the compiler would complain because the lifetimes would mismatch. So this is super cool because the compiler is checking for us that all the objects live as long as they have to live, and therefore we can't crash the firmware that way. Another issue that we have is that the firmware ABI is unstable because, of course, it is. Um, so Apple changes the driver and the firmware ABI randomly um, whenever they feel like it. Thankfully, we don't have to support um, arbitrary firmwares because we get to pick what firmwares we support and we um, install when we install Linux. Um, but we do need to support more than one firmware because there will be new um, generations and bug fixes and things like that. Um, so we can't just support a single firmware forever. And yeah, so these firmware versions have different ABIs and different structure definitions. So what do we do? Well, Rust can help with that too. We can use more Rust magic and write a proc macro that replicates the code for every version, but not the entire code, um, just the parts that change. So there's a macro and what it does is it appends the version name um, to the, um, um, the type names of the structs or enums or whatever. But also within those on types, the fields and the code can be conditional. And you can have multiple dimensions, like the firmware version and the GPU generation. Uh, and you can have comparison expressions. And this is super cool. Um, so that looks like this. Um, you have a versions macro uh, that is um, it gets past AGX. That just means you use the AGX um, version matrix. And then uh, you have things like this, where this field is conditional on the firmware version. So it only exists if the firmware is newer than that one. And even later, um, you have um, two pointers. And those pointers are two structures that are themselves versioned. And so there's that little code one colon for tag, and that's a magic um, marker for the uh, structure, uh, sorry, for the uh, macro. And that gets replaced with the uh, uh, the version name and dependent to the structure name. So in the end, all structures point uh, to the uh, inner structures that have the same version. But of course, before we can use any of this, we need to write um, REST DRM bindings. So I started working on that. And, you know, writing bindings can be pretty uh, hairy and uh, involve a lot of black magic. This is part of um, the code that sets up the IOCTO um, array for um, DRM driver. 
But the good news is that it's actually very easy to use. So this is what the driver's side looks like. And it's pretty simple. You just um, declare your driver, tell it what types you want your driver to use, some basic information, and then declare up to your IOCTOs and just pass it a list with the IOCTOL names, um, the structs, and uh, the facts and the um, callback that you want to call for that IOCTOL. And that macro um, takes care of writing all the uh, C compatible uh, Rust wrappers and doing all the safety stuff. So you, that you can just write your IOCTOLs in, in Rust. And, uh, you know, everything uh, just looks uh, normal. Um, so, did it work? Did this Rust experiment actually get us somewhere? Uh, let's see. Uh, on September 9th, um, 20, uh, sorry, on September 24th, um, I, f I got the first uh, renderers out of the uh, Rust driver, and this is KMS Cube. Um, KMS Arrow wasn't even working properly yet, so this is actually a frame buffer dump taken manually. Uh, but that was, you know, the very first renders. And just five days later, I had a full GNOME session running with Neverbaugh and in a GTD rendering and Firefox and YouTube playing and everything. Rust works! There are no concurrency issues. Everything just worked multi-threaded after working single-threaded. No UEFs, no leaks. Um, other bugs were like core MM bugs and logic stuff or, you know, really dumb mistakes in unsafe code. Um, I think that Rust encourages good design, so you end up architecting the driver in a way that like, sort of um, leads to the code, um, you know, having fewer bugs. And then the compiler is super picky and annoying, but when it works and when it compiles, it's like 90% of the way to working. It's really, really cool. Um, this is my first time doing a major thing in Rust, and I think it's the future. Uh, but there's still lots to do, of course. Um, we need to fix TLB and validation. Right now, I'm kind of turning off the GPU every single render pass. Uh, look, it only takes two milliseconds, okay? Um, but, uh, don't worry about it. Yeah, um, yeah don't, don't worry about it. Um, but uh, we need to fix uh, some easy perf issues, the debug spam, uh, the allocator is really dumb. Those are easy. Um, and we also need to port it to the M1 Pro Max Ultra, which is the G13X. And also the G14 G M2. We don't really know much about that one, but we should find out. Um, but most importantly, we need to design and implement the real UAPI because, as Alyssa said, we want this to be a Vulkan first, uh, modern, and properly designed UAPI. The current one is just a demo hack. Um, so that's going to require a lot of driver changes and a lot of Mesa changes. Uh, but we want to do it and uh, get it right the first time. So, yeah, there's still lots to do, but things are looking good. And um, I'm guessing you all want to see a demo, right? Right? You want to see a demo? I, th I think you already saw the demo. Didn't didn't they see the demo, Lena? Yeah, I, I think they already saw the demo because we've kind of been running this on an M1, um, you know, running a known session uh, with Firefox, and uh, I'm, j I'm just hanging around here, and, you know, I'm just uh, running a TTD window. Um, Let's see screen fetch. It's a, it's just a screen grab, um, you know. And this is just Firefox. Uh, what else do we have? Yeah, this is the... In a TCD um, blog, here's the magic wand that Alyssa is using. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I don't know. Should we try Neverball? Run everything at the same time as Neverball, see if it works. Hey, look at that. Some time for Q&A, maybe? Uh, yes, we have a question online already. So regarding firmware versions, are interface changes between versions discovered dynamically or have to be reverse engineered for each version to be supported? Um, they have to be reverse engineered for every version to be supported. Uh, the good news is that because we can use the hypervisor, we can pretty much just run macOS for that version. Um, I am really bad, bad at Neverball. Uh, we can just run macOS um, for that version, and it's usually pretty obvious when those fields are misaligned. Um, either the Python will actually throw an exception, or you can just kind of see that the, you know, the, the fields are not where they're supposed to be. Um, so it's not very difficult to find the changes, because they tend to be just adding and removing single fields. Um, the worst part is the initialization data. There's like some structures that are like over um, 64 kilobytes of nonsense, and there's a lot of changes there. Um, but thankfully, that is static, so you can just um, sort of work through it. And because the hypervisor supports live reloading of the tracer scripts, you can just boot macOS and see if it fails or, you know, the parse is wrong, and then just interrupt it. 
and then just iteratively um, edit the structure definitions in Python and just run one command and try again. And you don't have to reboot or anything. So um, I think I ported it to, um, I have, we support two versions now, and I ported it to the uh, second version in one day. So it's not actually that bad, um, though there are, I think, about 100 changes in total from one to the other. But, and, you know, the actual um, cycle is pretty fast. I, oh, yep. Um, I, I couldn't hear that. Did you hear that? Um, somewhat. Um, I think yeah, the question was about whether the versions macro um, generates the code for every version and then sort of explodes code sites. Um, the answer is yes. Um, for every version, like down the tree that has version dependencies, um, not the whole driver though, only the, the parts that actually change. So any structures that don't change, um, those can not be, ver be not versions. Um, but I mean, honestly, um, I don't think people are going to be too worried about their GPU driver being a couple megabytes. And, um, you know, in the end, the actual runtime code that is going to be, you know, using the cache and all that is just going to be the versions for whatever you're currently running. Um, so I'm not really too worried about that. Um, it does increase compile time, though, roughly proportional to the um, number of versions. So what I usually do when I'm debugging is just um, disable all but the version that I'm currently compiling for. Um, but again, that's not actually that bad. And by the way, people complain about Rust on compile times, but uh, at least in the kernel, it's not actually that bad. I think it's similar to C. Uh, the main difference is that Rust compiles basically the whole driver at once, so it doesn't really do incremental linking of like modules in the driver. But it does, also doesn't really take longer than C. I mean, it's a few seconds for uh, for my driver, so it's it's not really a bad um, development experience. And um, like the, the test cycle for us also is um, only a few seconds to reboot the machine and load a new kernel. So that's, um, that's the more important part. All right, thanks. Uh, so there's a, another question from the live audience. Uh, this one is for mm -hmm. Alisa. Uh, so I know AGX is a tiling renderer, and uh, so you say it's a mobile GPU, but literally aren't all GPUs in the past few years uh, also were tilers? Example, NVIDIA since Maxwell, AMD since Vega, Intel since Gen 11. Is there still a meaningful distinction between those uh, and AGX that makes it a mobile GPU, where those were not? Uh, so. I I should, I guess, have the disclaimer that I only work on uh, mobile ARM hardware. I'm not super current on what's happening in the uh, in, t in the uh, x86 space. Uh, that being said, there are, I do think there are distinctions between the uh, traditional tilers, namely Molly and Imagine Apple. Um, I, I do hope you guys have liked hearing about our PowerVR driver. Um, I mean our AGX driver, our Apple driver, the Apple GP. Sorry, I had a slip. Had a slip there. Uh, uh, so, uh, th thank you, Frank. Um, I. So I do think there's a, a distinction between some of these traditional tilers uh, that follow the very pure uh, tile buff. Everything goes through the tile buffer. Um, you have the dedicated tiling stage. Uh, vertex, the output of vertex shaders have to go through main memory uh, because of tiling, or at least the tiles, the tiler output goes through main memory. Um, it's my understanding that the more uh, slightly higher, less pure tilers have, for example, Qualcomm has the immediate mode. Um, oh, I see we're, okay. Uh, <laughs> Not a great idea, but I love it. Uh, <laughs> uh, I know Qualcomm can switch to media mode rendering um, in some cases. It's my understanding that what the desktop GPUs have that are tilers are not, it, the traditional tiler sense are just borrowing some of the better ideas of them. But honestly, that's a question for somebody who works on Intel or AMD or NVIDIA. I'm not qualified to answer that. Uh, 
Uh, yes, thank you. So we have another question, this time for Lina. Uh, this seems very stable, so you that could uh, do the whole presentation on top of your code. Is it usually this stable or should this be done only by professionals? <laughs> <laughs> um, so here's the funny thing. After, um, so it was completely crashy and I was getting firmware um, asserts and things like that and I wasn't sure what the problem was. I did know that there was some issues with TLB and validation because um, I could see that like the kernel was crashing and then I dumped uh, the memory and it was um, tile buffer pointers. Uh, and But I wasn't sure how bad it was. And um, then I went to sleep and I woke up the next morning and I had the you know genius um, idea of waiting for the GPU to turn off um, after every render, which I knew cleared the DLBs. And uh, what can I say? After I did that, I don't think I've actually seen it crash once. And we don't even have GPU fault, like user space fault recovery yet. So if a single GPU fault occurred, it would just crash everything. It stopped happening. Um, I mean, obviously, the turning off the GPU thing is a terrible hack and destroys um, performance. But I mean, it's still rendering at about 60 FPS or at least 30, not sure. Um, I think I think my capture card is 30, but the it's probably getting more, more like 60 um, in the actual rendering. Um, so yeah, like, I, I don't know. I mean, obviously, we need to fix that. Um, but I think once we fix the TLB issue, it's, uh, yeah, it's pretty stable. Um, I saw it saying Rust works. Like, once things, you know, like, once the logic is correct, all the weird, you know, highs and bugs and concurrency issues and, um, like, we, I just find green locking, right? This isn't the big driver lock. Um, and all that just works. And the, the whole fearless concurrency, um, you know, setting point of Rust is real. Hello. How do you plan to handle like complete major firmware revisions with that like version max version that you're doing? Like, what if the structure like completely and entirely changes to the point where it can't be represented by the macro? Uh, I think I think uh, the the question was, what if everything changes? Like, it's not just minor changes to the structures. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Um. So. Uh, I think Apple isn't a big fan of making major changes like that. Um, but if like um, like sub modules of the um, of the driver um, end up changing significantly, then we can just um, have like different Rust modules, and I can probably just make a change to the frog macro to support like importing differentially or something like that. It shouldn't be that difficult, um, or to just um, like build versions for a subset of versions, and then we can have like multiple versions of the code actually copied and pasted and changed completely. Um, and then, you know, one applies to some versions and the other to other versions. I thought of that. I'll probably add a conditional to the versions macro so they can do that. Um, but we don't really expect it to be, you know, that bad, um, at least uh, for a few generations. So we'll see about M2. I don't expect it to be very different, though, because Apple do seem to share the same firmware code base for different GPUs, and they have their own house inside, and you can kind of see this from strings in the firmware. Um, and they do seem to have, like, I saw some... Um, debug logs uh, from like iOS, you know, like four GPU revisions back uh, that it were very verbose and had a lot of interesting details. And like everything in there matched everything I know about this one. So I don't think Apple are very likely to do like a major change to the firmware design um, such that like we need to make a complete break. Yes, we have more questions from people. Uh attending virtually. So for Lina, have you run into any roadblocks or unexpected issues being, I believe, one of the first people to create a new Linux driver in Rust? Um, so I ran into some things. One of the biggest ones is that um, Rust doesn't have placement new, which means that it can't instantiate objects in memory that you allocate using a custom allocator. Um, it basically can only instantiate objects in the stack. And um, the compiler can optimize some of those copies, um, but it's not guaranteed. And so this GPU has, you know, some structures that are over 64 kilobytes, um, and they're sing you know, they're fixed layout. It's not like we can break them up. Um, and yeah, you know, if that goes on the kernel stack, that uh, stack overflows. Um, so that's why I had that place macro that I showed earlier. That is a crazy, um, ridiculous, you know, voodoo, dark magic, Hildrich, or. Um, Micro, um, though it does work, um, we can improve it to make it a bit more, a uh, bit safer and a bit nicer to use. Um, but what that macro basically does is it parses the um, like uh, structure initialization um, 
syntax recursively and then initializes every field separately and checks that they all have been initialized so that it basically um, piecewise instantiate the structure directly at the um, target location and then avoids having to have it on the stack. But yeah, this isn't really nice. And I do hope that Rust grows um, placement new support someday so we can avoid this. Um, but it's not a showstopper. Other than that, um, that's pretty the major one. There's, there's been a few minor things, but pretty much everything can be worked around. Um, obviously, it's still a work in progress, but um, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty happy with uh, the current state of things. So, what is currently missing for other M devices to be supported? Is it just the firmware struct? Uh, uh, for all the other devices, sorry? Uh, all the other M devices to be supported. Is it just the firmware struct or something else? It's really, I, f I mean, honestly, the firmware would be the least of my worries. Um, for the M1, for the, anything that's in the M1 series, those are all uh, the same version of the ma major version of the architecture, G13. Uh, so uh, already I know uh, somebody tried actually running the Mesa driver on Mac OS uh, on a uh, M1 Max system and found that it almost worked, but there was some graphical glitches. So what that tells me is that there are going to be some minor changes needed everywhere in the stack, both Mesa and kernel. Uh, but for the most part, I expect once uh, once you know, Lena gets her hands on a uh, M1 Pro machine, that should that should be fine. The bigger issue is going to be the M2, uh, which is a different. I bl I believe that's going to be a different major architecture, G14 instead of G13, uh, and I I don't actually know yet how uh, how different the architectures are going to be from either the kernels or user spaces perspective. Um, there is a very big gap in terms of different uh, different hardware manufacturers' attitudes towards uh, randomly changing everything every generation for no reason whatsoever. Uh, on one hand, you have you have hardware uh, you have hardware engineers that uh, try their best to only change things when there's a need to change them because you know verification is expensive and so that makes things easier for us. Uh, on the other hand, you have hardware engineers who know that if they make a if they make a good GPU, uh, then they have no more job anymore because the GPU job is done. So uh, you just have to keep making changes to justify everything, and it makes things really hard on the driver people. But we're not going to complain because that means we continue to have work to do too. So um, buy lots of new GPUs. Um, honestly, we, given that I've only seen a single. Uh, a single Imagine Apple GPU so far. Uh, I'm. It's. Uh, I don't know what the attitude is going to be. We know uh, from other other parts of the Apple uh, system on chip, they don't seem to. They don't seem to make backwards compatible breaking or non backwards compatible changes without good reasons to. So, if we're lucky, uh, it should be pretty easy. If we're unlucky, oh well. Guess we have a new driver to write. Um, I don't expect it'll be either extreme. I don't know yet where to predict where it'll be for Mesa. And Lena may have other perspectives on how that'll be for the kernel. But ultimately, uh, I can be pretty sure that M2 will require changes for both of us. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if there's like um, actually zero changes to the structures for M2 because like they they wrote that into a firmware upgrade. So we support you know a firmware version that supports M2. And like that was all back, you know, it's the same code base. So they ended up with the same structures. Um, but then again, they might um, have some if tests there um, or an actual fork. So it could be either of those. Um, there's definitely going to be a lot of changes to the initialization data, to all the constants. There's giant piles of constants. Um, so all that, you know, when we get to the M2, we'll see what changes and move those to um, configuration structs um, that we can uh, have different values for different generations. Um, but yeah, the, I think the, the more interesting question is what Alyssa said, the, uh, the user space side and how much they changed in the pipelines and all those um, commands and, and all that stuff. What The one part that does uh, make me cautiously optimistic, and I do have to underscore cautiously when we're talking about hardware engineers here, uh, is uh, the archaeology I did uh, trace comparing the uh, what, what I have reverse engineered from the Apple GPU to uh, the PowerVR RGX uh, driver that's now upstream in Mesa, and for the bit of history, uh, I started I started reverse engineering AGX 
uh, before before the PowerVR open source driver actually materialized. So that was very much a uh, in the dark for me. And even once the code dropped, I could tell that there were things in common, but it was not yet obvious how to actually match up um, structures in PowerVR to structures in uh, AGX. Uh, over time, with more insight into both the PowerVR and AGX sides, it became clear you know, there are data structures that are essentially identical between the two. There are data structures that have nothing in common. Um, I can see the clear lineage. I can see where they diverged many years ago. And actually, if you go if you go digging through uh, through old iOS versions, uh, I I keep talking about the G13 architecture that's in the M1. Uh, I can see there was an AGX all the way of G4, which was in you know a 2014 era iPhone or something. So uh, the M1 may have come out of nowhere if you weren't paying attention, but this is not a new architecture. This has been in your in your iPhone for years. You've just not noticed. Um, so in that sense, I can see the progression. Given how much I've been able to learn from the power VR driver, despite them diverging so many years ago, that makes me hopeful that actually it might, they might not be changing things so aggressively. Uh, once you have all of those years of divergence, there's enough different that it doesn't make sense to share a driver between the modern power VR and the modern AGX. Uh, if we could roll back the clock 10 years ago, we, and we were reverse engineering the iPhone, and uh, the imagination people wanted to do an open source driver and then, and we kept working on both simultaneously, then yeah, at this point, we'd probably be supporting one, both in one driver stack. And it'd be a mess, and we'd be constantly bitching about it, and we'd be dis determining, you know, trying to decide when we, should, when we should fork off, like Intel finally did for uh, Crocus and Iris, for example, or Anv and HasVK. Um, but, at the end of the day, these they have the common lineage. Uh, there are lots of nonsense fields and data structures that I would not have been able to determine no matter how long I stared at them, except for the fact that the answer is literally right there in Mesa nowadays. So uh, like I said, thank you, Frank. And I believe I'm out of time now. Uh, yes, we are out of time. Awesome. Uh, thank you for listening. Uh, thank you for having Lena here.
Hello, welcome to Zinc the Talk. I'm Mike from the presentation division of Super Good Code, and I'll be doing the talking. I also do most of the zinking. Now, with that said, if anybody has something they want to shout out, contribute during the talk, feel free. No restrictions. We've got break time coming up so everybody can relax a little bit. However, with all that said, I want to stress that this is not a meme presentation, all right? This is a serious conference for serious people talking about serious problems to find serious solutions. So there will be no jokes of any kind. Which is to say that if you don't get them, they probably weren't for you. <laughs> Let's begin. What is Zinc? Zinc is a layered OpenGL driver. It runs on top of Vulkan to communicate with the hardware. What does Zinc support? Zinc supports everything. Big GL, GLES, WGL for Windows, and a whole host of extensions, as you can see here. Now, I am obligated, according to the synopsis that I provided to the timetable, to give you some history on Zinc. Let's do this really quickly because it gets boring fast. Zinc was started in 2018 by Eric. Thanks, Eric. I jumped in in 2020 when Daniel Stone suggested it might be a nice, easy starter project for learning driver development. It's been a few years since then, and we've seen a lot of contributions from a lot of people, and that's amazing. The one way I like to look at this is to recognize the contributions of one individual in particular as it relates to zinc over time. Now, clearly, this is the man, the myth, the legend, Dave Airley. And I'd like to say a special thanks to Red Hat for generously donating two full years of his time to do nothing but review zinc patches. <laughs> it's not an exaggeration to say that without him, without Red Hat's support, zinc would not be where it is today. So huge thanks to Dave, huge thanks to Red Hat. We really, really appreciate you. But. What is it that took so long to tick off that final GL version, get CTS passing, and bring Zinc to where it is today? Well, to understand this, we're going to have to talk about some things that I hate, such as provoking Vertex, where we had this discount generic brand GLX gears for so long until finally a Vulcan extension fixed it with a one-liner. Another thing, GL point size. In OpenGL, you have the client API for setting it, you have the shader API for setting it. There's a nice default of 1.0. In Vulkan, all you get is the shader API, and that's it. So getting this correct in all cases was quite challenging. There's obviously more things that I hate, including transform feedback, notable because it was the very first thing that Zinc needed to be tackled in order to hit GL 3.0. Everybody knows transform feedback is terrible. What you may or may not know is that Gallium's interface for transform feedback is also terrible. <laughs> Everybody has the same code in their driver that converts the stupid register index back to the near variable locations. I've seen it. This is stupid. It's terrible. Another thing that's terrible, non-seamless cube maps. We thought we left them behind with OpenGL as the default there. We didn't. They're still alive and well in OpenGL, and Zinc needs to support them because CTS tests them. So I spent quite a lot of time on this. I wrote a shader emulation pass to handle it because somebody tried to propose a Vulkan extension, and it got shot down. The shader emulation pass worked great, except for a few corner cases where it didn't. So I wrote another shader emulation pass, which worked great, except for a few corner cases that didn't. It doesn't matter which one eventually got merged because Zinc uses the extension anyway. Now, something I really hate is 64-bit emulation on 32-bit hardware. It's complex. It's very slow. How slow, you might be asking? Well, on an Intel Ice Lake laptop, it takes well over three hours to do a piglet run. And when it's active, as you can see, it's very confusing and hard to tell what's going on. Now, other things I hate because this is not going to end soon. <laughs> PBO operations. Yes, that's right. Alpha, luminance, intensity formats. They're terrible. They don't have Vulcan equivalents. 
OpenGL supports them, OpenGL requires them, a lot of things in OpenGL uses them. So imagine my surprise when last year I got a ticket from a user saying that CSGO takes literal hours to open under Zinc. <laughs> hours. This is slower than software rendering. The reason? PBO downloads, full screen alpha format downloads every frame before even reaching the title screen. Incredible. So I took the hammer to this. I wrote Uber shaders for compute that became pipe texture transfer compute. Now, the way this works is it uses a compute shader to do all the PBO download on the compute queue as a transfer operation. So this is asynchronously compiled now, and there's no stuttering, there's no delay, it works great. I even wrote a benchmarking tool called PBO Bench in Piglet that I could use to determine when to enable this versus when to use more native operations like a fragment shader. If you're working on a Gallium driver and you're not familiar with this, you might want to check it out because it can yield over 10 times performance increase. There's still more things that I hate. Gallium I.O. lowering, near I.O. lowering. I hate this so much. It cost me over a month of my life trying to get buffer uh, access to work in Zinc with the conversion to Spur. Gallium lowers everything to D words. Vulcan needs D refs. There's a slight difference, and getting it correct is impossible. So I threw out the whole thing, rewrote it as D refs, and at last it works. Hooray. But the final thing that I hate, and maybe the thing that I hate the most of all, and probably some of you are guilty of this, internet blog posts about Vulcan descriptor models. I've read every single one. I've watched all your videos. Stop writing them. You don't need all this descriptor caching. You don't need all this clever descriptor indexing. You can just be simple and get great performance. This is worse than doom scrolling. Stop doing this to me, please. So. Finally, we're at the present. Zinc has all the feature support. It's passing CTS on a number of drivers. It's even pretty fast sometimes. Let's take a look at a very brief status update. With that out of the way, what are some of the current problems that Zinc still faces? Well, naturally, we have to talk about WSI, Windows System Integration. Yes, we're going there. So. The most obvious problem that every GL driver in Mesa has with WSI is the DRI front end. It's terrible, it's heavy, it's complex enough to fly a space shuttle. This is a huge problem for anybody trying to work on it, and it's the main reason why it took Ajax and me a year and a half to land copper. Copper finally allows us to use the Vulcan WSI for zinc, which eliminates lots of problems like artifacts and synchronization errors. So, we have that, but there is still work to be done in copper. Copper still has issues. For example, ancillary buffer invalidation hits Tyler's hard because it doesn't allow elimination of depth stencil rights. I tried adding this recently. It worked, but it had to go through the DRI front end. So then Ajax tried writing a version that was cleaner, and then that one still hasn't landed yet because he had to go through the DRI front end too. You can see where I'm going with this. So there's other problems that go through the DRI front end, like auto loading. I landed this recently. It might be in Mesa 22.3, but it has its own issues when you're trying to run as a full software driver because Zinc has no ability to detect the presence of the DRI protocol up front. Thus, it crashes sometimes and explodes. But this isn't so different from normal operations when sometimes copper will just crash and explode anyway. It's a relatively new technology that was only merged a few months ago. It's not robust. It needs more testing. So what can we do to solve these problems? Well, there's the obvious solution for the DRI front end. We need to just crush it down. We need to squash it. We need to get rid of all the stupid indirection, all the V tables, all the pointers, make it something that unascended mortals can potentially comprehend. With this done, maybe we can get some of these other issues fixed a little bit more quickly. Additionally, copper needs a lot more testing, just like zinc. So if you've got free time, you've got an OpenGL app that you like, try running it in zinc. If it explodes, file a ticket. We can get that fixed. We can get that sharp edge buffed right out. 
There's more problems that we know of today. Tyler optimizations. This is an area that we've only just started to scratch the surface on for zinc. There's still a lot of work to be done. Now, the main reason that this is a problem is because Tylers operate differently than media mode renderers. In a Tyler, starting and stopping a render pass is very, very expensive in some cases, specifically when you're loading the previous contents of your attachments or you're unnecessarily storing data. This uses more bandwidth and it causes performance degradation. The reason this is an issue specifically with Zinc is that Gallium provides us with none of the metadata that we need to utilize Vulkan render passes. For example, the layout, the loadout, store op, and the resolve attachments. So, when we begin a Vulkan render pass, we need this information up front, we don't have it, we have bad performance. Who could have guessed? Let's look at some potential solutions. This is one that I've come up with. I don't know if it'll work, I'd like some feedback on. We have threaded context, which could enable us to do what Angle does, which is to use a serialized GL command stream and then enable the driver to do read ahead on it to determine how the attachments in a frame buffer will be used for a given render pass. This would uh, work by allowing drivers to call in using callbacks and functions and whatnot that I haven't written because who knows who's going to act it or knack it, as the case may be. And the metadata would be parsed and such, and it would probably be a little bit complicated, but overall not too bad. Um, in general, you would want to be looking at some of the states that I've listed in the slides, uh, but I think uh, it's got a very limited scope. So I'm definitely interested in hearing some feedback uh, on that topic. Maybe I'll create an issue. Maybe you can find me after my talk and we can have a little discussion if you've got an opinion. Um, additionally, resolve attachments. When you've got a uh, multi-sampled frame going to scan out, you know ahead of time that you're going to be doing this resolve, so you've got the resolve attachment. I've done the work here. I've already plumbed this through the DRI front end, huzzah, uh, and I've put up an MR. This does work. It adds the resolve attachment to the frame buffer state. Any Gallium driver can then make use of it. Is this actually useful, though? I don't know. I want some feedback on that. Hopefully, people are going to give me that feedback. Um, of course, Gallium is not the most optimal place that we can do these optimizations for Zinc. While it's great that we want to look into this and resolve it at the Gallium level, in the end, we want to solve this as a Vulcan problem too. So I've made a proposal uh, to the working group that is being worked on, but ideally what we want is something that enables deferred decision making for render passes so that all of this metadata can be provided at a later time. But, as we know, anything Vulcan has to go through Kronos, and we're not likely to see it tomorrow, or next week, or next month, next year maybe, who knows. So we definitely want to look at solving this at the Gallium level for the near term, for the midterm. Um, now, the final issue that we know about with Zinc today, and we definitely want to uh, solve, is slow vertex state changes. What do I mean by this? Well, in Vulkan, when you're changing the vertex state, you need all of the info for the vertex elements at the time that you're changing the state. However, in Gallium, this is split between two callbacks. You get the stride with the vertex buffers, and you get the rest of the info with the vertex element state. This is not good for Zinc. This is especially not good because the overhead that manifests appears in two places. You get it in VBuff because I've had to add some validation there to handle another fun rule of Vulkan, which states that all vertex elements must be aligned to their element size using the stride, offset, and size. Thus, again, we need all of that data at the same time, but we only get it piecemeal. So the current solution is we do the comparisons partially and then do additional comparisons at draw time. This is not optimal for performance. This is not the best solution. In Zinc, as I've mentioned, we need all of that data at the time that we do the vertex state change, don't have it. Instead, anytime anything changes, Zinc has to iterate over all of the attributes, all of the buffers, and it has to generate a new struct. This is not optimal for performance. So, this hurts us in real world scenarios such as a recent friendly benchmarking session against Angle where Zinc lost out on nearly every single CPU intensive case, specifically when profiled due to this vertex element state change overhead. So I think this is definitely something that we need to look into. However, I don't have a good solution for it at the Gallium level. 
The best that I can do is propose that potentially we use a second set of vertex interfaces for zinc only. Obviously, this is not a great solution because we don't want to have to maintain more than one code path to do the same thing. If anybody has any better ideas, I'm definitely interested, definitely open to suggestions. This is the best I've come up with. Uh, at the gallium level overall, I've seen some discussion popping up lately uh, about general overhead for vertex state changes and how we can improve that. I think that's uh, an equally valuable problem that we really need to be solving because mitigating that also mitigates the existing overhead for sync. So I have invoked the B word. I'm sorry, but now we have to talk about benchmarks because when you talk about zinc, you have to talk about the benchmarks. It's the only way. However, we're here, we're at a conference, we're being social, so I've devised a different sort of benchmark here. I call this the P rating. And what you see here in this graph is the raw P value over time. You can see at zinc's inception back in 2018, it was roughly zero because when you look at the P rating, you want to be looking at the trend line or, for you math nerds, the derivative. So looking at it at the beginning of time, you see it's, it's close to zero. There's not much change. However, of late, it's been a very steep slope, closer to over 1.0. Very healthy, very robust P rating. But benchmarking cannot be done in isolation. Here is Radeon SI's P rating as well because we must always benchmark against Radeon SI when we talk about zinc. It's the only way. So we look at Radeon SI over time, we see at the beginning sort of the same type of thing. It's very slow, accelerates, but for the entirety of zinc's existence, it's mostly leveled off. It's got a very low P rating. And for the entirety of zinc's existence, it's had roughly double the P rating of Radeon SI. I'm sure some of you can see where I'm going with this because the P rating is actually the frequency of pharonics mentions over time. <laughs> Shout out to my pharonics comment section. Keep it wholesome. You're asking right now, Mike, what does this have to do with the technical merits of zinc? And the answer is nothing, but it's a benchmark that zinc is winning at, so I've brought it here with me. <laughs> now, all this brings us to what is left in zinc. What more is there to do? There's quite a lot left to do. Um, for 22.3 Mesa release in particular, I've made it my mission to eliminate shader stuttering. We're going to have pre-compiles at last. And this is possible. I have done the work. I've put in the time. I've done some testing with all of these extensions that have finally come together. It's possible. You will be able to game on Zinc. Sometimes. <laughs> Sometimes. There are some caveats. Uh, in addition to all the listed extensions, you also need some additional features. And those include dynamic patch control points for tessellation shader compiling. They include graphics pipeline library fast linking so that you can combine all the partial pipelines at once. And when I say this, note that I mean you actually need to have fast fast linking, not just advertise that it's fast. That doesn't work. Um, and you also need a few dozen uh, vertex attribute formats, which are not mandated by the core Vulkan spec. Specifically, you need all of the three component vertex attribute formats that are not mandated by the spec. So with all of this in place, it's possible at a technical level to have pre-compiling. And there are no hardware drivers in the world that implement all these features. Is what I would have said until last Friday when NVIDIA finally kicked out their latest beta driver supporting the bare minimum of features that Zinc requires. However, until then, LavaPipe was the only driver that implemented all these features. It's not that useful for testing and gaming, as you might imagine. So all I can say is, the work I've done has no bugs whatsoever, and if you try and file a ticket, you're wrong. <laughs> now, moving on to other problems for the future. Vulkan. Obviously, I'm not talking about the API. Vulkan, as we know, is an incredible API. It's completely flawless, especially the parts I've worked on. No, I'm talking about what implements Vulkan as an API, the drivers. When you have dozens of drivers across all types of hardware, 
implementing the same specification, you get differences in behavior. These are bugs. So what happens when I encounter a driver bug? I take the usual steps. I figure out what's causing it if I can. I find an easy reproduction case and I report it. I try and work with the driver teams. I try and make sure that we can get things resolved in a, in a reasonable amount of time. In general, I've noticed that there are three types of teams that work on drivers. The first type, shout out to the turnip team. The first type of driver team works at an unimaginable speed and resolves the issues that I find almost overnight, usually no more than two days of turnaround time. It's amazing. The second type is what I would say is the more reasonable type, the less intimidating type. It takes about a week, maybe two weeks. There's some back and forth. We get an MR up. There's some discussion. There's a lot of testing. The fix lands. It's still fixed. I love you guys. Thank you. Great to work with you. That brings us to the final group of driver engineers. This is the type where I report an issue to your team, and now I'm at a presentation talking about the fact that those issues still exist. <laughs> so you know who you are. If there's anything I can do to help to try and get these issues resolved faster, please let me know because it seems like the only alternative otherwise is to ask Ricardo to implement more CTS cases that we already have in GLCTS. Ricardo's time is valuable. I don't think we should be wasting it like this. Again, another problem with Vulcan that is not the specification. What happens when we have slow Vulcan drivers? Zinc is a layered driver, which means anytime the Vulcan driver underneath it is slow, Zinc is slow. Now, many drivers optimize for GPU, but what they don't optimize for is CPU. Therefore, I have to plug, again, you knew it was coming, VK overhead. It is the latest, the best, the only Vulkan CPU benchmarking tool. It has lots of cases for micro-optimizing, micro-profiling, everything you can imagine. And it has real-world effects already. People are already using this to find issues. Just recently, Turnip found an issue with slow VRAM reads in their driver for push descriptors, easily fixed once they knew it was there. Rad V recently discovered a 5,000% performance degradation with sampler descriptor updates. Much more difficult to fix, but at least we know that it's there now, thanks to VK overhead. Additionally, I know for a fact that at least one major hardware vendor uses VK overhead internally. So don't wait. Try VK overhead today. 300, no, a thousand percent performance increase or your money back, guaranteed. Now, looking ahead to the future, there are more things to do in zinc. For example, there are all these pipe caps in gallium. What do they all do? Literally nobody knows. There's documentation for some of them. Others remain a mystery. Just the other week, I was informed of a couple of pipe caps that increased performance under GL thread by over 10%. These pipe caps matter. I have no idea what they all are. If you're a gallium developer, if you know about pipe caps and you know that Zinc isn't using good pipe cap, let me know so that I can use your cool pipe cap. Also, do we actually need over 270 pipe caps? Platform testing is another issue facing Zinc going forward. Zinc runs on lots of platforms, almost all of them, in fact. But in CI, we only test three, Lava Pipe, Anv, and Turnip. Should we be testing more? If so, what should we be testing? There are so many things to test, but I need your feedback and probably more CI resources in order to test them. More things that we should probably care about. Platform distribution for Mesa. Zinc runs on Windows. Sometimes it's even very fast. But despite joining the illustrious ranks of Lava Pipe, LLVM Pipe, that, of drivers that run on both Linux and Windows, Mesa still has no official Windows distribution. There are no official binaries that ship for Windows. Do we want to change this? I don't know. Currently, people on Windows just go and download random binaries from GitHub. We get bug reports, but are they really our bugs? I don't know. I think this is a topic we should be looking at. Lastly, on this part of the 
presentation that is nowhere near over. Zinc needs your help. As you can see, my schedule leaves me very little time to do actual zinc development on features, on refactoring, on code cleanup, or the most important of all, on blogging. So, you might be out there in the audience, your name might be Chad, you might work for a very large tech company, you might be thinking, well, how can I jump in on this? The answer is, I've created a huge list of starter tasks with varying difficulty for you. You can jump right into all of them, any of them, or even some of the unlisted ones. Find your own sharp edge, buff it out, have some fun, or just do some testing, report issues. Literally any contribution to Zinc is welcome at this time. This is beautiful. I will tell Chad about this. Thank you, Chad. <laughs> but we're now at the best part of the presentation. What is the current status of Zinc on all of these drivers? So. Lava pipe. This is the best driver. Obviously, I work on it. We knew this was going to happen. It supports all of the features. It's mostly passing CTS. GL 4.6 passes, except for we recently enabled subgroups, so it doesn't pass. There's one CTS case that's broken. There's one CTS case that has a weird LLVM bug. Shout out to LLVM experts. I know you're out there. Help. Um, there's some guard band clipping issues on ES. Uh, I tried fixing this but probably I need somebody from VMware or Dave to actually help me fix this because it's hard. Shout out to everybody out there that knows what I'm talking about or hidden LLVM guard band clipping experts. I know you're out there too. And this is a special driver to me because this is the first driver I ever tested Zinc on. Uh, so it's quite well supported as you can see. Most of the basic features are in there. Uh, it does not yet support pre-compilation, -com hopefully soon, uh, once more of the graphics pipeline library stuff lands. Um, with that said, ANV is very notable in that it's the only driver in the world that fully passes all versions of CTS, no exceptions. So incredible work there by Intel. Really the only negative I can say is that the performance is a little bit variable. We're starting to do more profiling there recently, and there are some odd corner cases where performance is just non-existent. Um, anybody who's interested in doing some profiling or helping out there, greatly appreciated. Moving on, RADV, we knew this was going to have great feature support. Um, it does. Uh, the only thing that's missing so far, we can't yet do pre-compilation. Still waiting on some graphics pipeline library stuff to be fixed and worked on. It's in the pipe. It's happening. Um, it is the closest driver next to NVIDIA to implementing all of the sparse texture OpenGL extension. So that's pretty incredible. Um, it is very, very, very close to passing all versions of CTS. There's an issue open for one of the fails, and there's an MR open for the other two fails. Surely there, we'll see the progress here, and that's going to get cleaned up and fixed. Um, the performance is incredible. You won't believe it. Uh, it's that good. If you're looking for a reference driver for Zinc performance, this is probably a great pick. But if we slap an evil mustache on RADV, <laughs> we see a little bit of a different story here. Uh, AMD Pro is missing a lot of features. Um, last I tested, uh, quite a lot of features, so I'm, I'm really hopeful that they decide to or they find the resources to support more of the things that Zinc needs so that at the very least, even if we aren't hitting the most optimal path with dynamic vertex input state, we can still be hitting the pre-compile state. We can not have stuttering in games. Um, CTS, also a bit of a different story, unfortunately. There are hundreds and hundreds of failures. I've tried reporting them. I'm here talking about it in a presentation, draw your own conclusions. With all that said, though, the performance is good. Uh, definitely nothing to shake a stick at here. Um, if you're running Zinc on top of AMD Pro, you would think you were using a very credible uh, and competently written OpenGL driver. Turnip is really, I, I would say, probably the greatest success story of Zinc. I only started testing on Turnip a few months ago, and at that time, it was unable to even advertise GL 4.6 natively. Since then, it has come from not only being able to advertise GL 4.6, but it supports all of the required features and extensions. So this is really incredible work from the Turnip team. Additionally, CTS is a similar story. When I started on this a few months ago, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of CTS failures. Today, less than a handful. 
just unbelievable work. Uh, the performances also come a long way, and we're making great strides on that too. Uh, as I mentioned, there are some tiling issues that we're aware of. We're still doing some profiling on the turnip side as well. Um, so I'd expect that by the end of the year, you should see near native performance on most things when running on turnip. NVIDIA proprietary, we have to bring them up. They are the only driver that supports literally all of the features. It's incredible, but we expected this of NVIDIA too. Um, unfortunately, what they don't support is passing all of CTS. Um, I've reported a number of the failure cases specific to GL 4.6. There is a document. They have the document. I'm here talking about it in the presentation. Uh, ES 3.2 has a lot more failures. I haven't reported all of them yet, but uh, I'm planning to do that in the very near future. I'm hopeful we can get this worked out and resolved. Um, that said, the performance, as we would expect, it's great. All the optimal code paths are taken. Everything runs very smoothly, with the caveat that occasionally you'll just explode in some weird WSI thing, like if you're trying to replay a trace. Um, for some reason, their swap chain create just throws an error, and there's nothing more that can be done. I'm hopeful that this issue that I've also reported can be fixed in the future. But. <sighs> <laughs> now we're going to talk about NVK, and I know you were all paying attention when Jason gave his talk earlier, but what he didn't tell you is that when I first tested his private branch of NVK, my mind was blown. Not only are all the features supported, but the first time, the very first time I tried running CTS, it passed. No failures, no flakes, it just passed. I could not believe my eyes. So that said, we knew it was going to be faster than Nouveau to run Zinc on NVK. We knew that. That was never up for debate, never up for question. But what we didn't know was how much faster this was going to be than NVIDIA's proprietary driver. I'll tell you, when I was seeing the FPS on these, it seemed almost unbelievable. But then again, we knew this was going to be the case too, right? This is going to be the first driver written entirely in assembly. It's the first driver that's going to be using NIR 2.0. Um, the only bad thing I can say about this is once I asked Jason if he'd ever encountered a hang, and he blocked me. But, <laughs> but before you get upset, in his defense, that was justified. I was in the wrong. That was rude. So Jason, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Now. With all that out of the way, the last driver to talk about is, of course, your driver. What driver is it? I don't know. You tell me. I can only talk about the drivers that I personally test. So if you have a Vulcan driver out there that doesn't have a slide in this presentation, let me know. Maybe send me some hardware, and then I can test it faster. So ideally, I will be able to talk about your feature support, your CTS coverage, your amazing performance in my next presentation. Now, with all that said, the presentation is over, and I would like to say a special thanks to Valve for sponsoring Super Good Code to come out here and deliver the talk, as well as for their incredible presentation deck hardware. If you give a lot of presentations, I strongly urge you to expense one of these because it makes the whole thing effortless, <laughs> completely zero effort. So, questions? Hold your applause for now, please. Thank you. Uh, yes, we have a question from the live audience. Are there any NV perf problems due to ANV zinc or both? Sorry, sorry. Are there uh, ANV perf problems due to ANV zinc or both? I assume we're talking about NVIDIA's proprietary driver here? ANV. So oh, ANV. Sorry, there are so many similar letters. Um, it's unclear at this time where the performance issues are coming from when running on Intel. Um, we've only recently become aware of them, so I can't give a definitive answer on that. Sorry. Uh-oh.
So the question was, would it be possible to return the inner part of the render pass in a secondary command buffer and then record the render pass begin and end in a primary command buffer? The answer is yes. Angle does this, so it's definitely possible. However, secondary command buffers are terrible, and I do not want to use them. Question all the way in the back from Melissa. So the question is, if we move the stride member from the set vertex buffers callback to the CSO, would that solve the problem? Yes. OK. Because I'm trying to keep zinc, ah, yes, of course, I have to repeat the question. Sorry, sorry. Um, the question is, why not make a bargain with the devil? Why not use secondary command buffers? And the answer is, I don't want to add that level of complexity to zinc because it's already quite complex and difficult for people to get into. Um, if there's absolutely no other solution to the problem, we'll have to revisit uh, the decision at that time, but I feel confident that we can find alternatives. All right, thank you.
Hi, folks. So, so my name is Isabella, and uh, I'm really excited to be here today. Uh, so, first uh, disclaimer: this, this, the name of this presentation is like actually a little misleading, because like we started this thinking that we'd be all over the FPUs things in the AMD GPU, but uh, we're not. <laughs> so, <laughs> with that out of the way. Um, well, I'm a Red Hat software engineer. Uh, this has actually nothing to do with the work here. Um, I also study at the University of Sao Paulo, so we are all Brazilian. And uh, I'm actually now conducting a work on the open source GPU stack stuff. So it's actually pretty weird to see that like we're always talking about Vulkan and stuff here, but people actually just use CUDA, and that's pretty sad. So I am... Uh, finishing my bachelor's in molecular sciences, and that's a weird course, and uh, I don't expect you to know what that means. So together with me, I have Magali and Mayura. So Magali actually also studies in the University of Sao Paulo. She is doing some research in the introduction of K-Unit uh, in subsystems in the kernel. And uh, Mayura uh, also studies in the University of Sao Paulo. She is with Igalia uh, on the coding experience. And uh, she's researching some, I don't know, how can I say that? So like, what's the minimal effort you have to do to have real-time applications running in standard kernel? So we are all in the GSOC team, the same uh, Google Summer of Code team, if you don't know what that means. And uh, I have, uh, we have a friend, Thales, who could not be here today, but he presented a related talk in the Linux Plumbers conference. I don't know if you saw that. Uh, in the kernel testing and dependability track. So that's it. Uh, before we continue, we'd like to make a huge shout out to all of these names here. So AMD, like they donated GPUs to us, that was awesome. And uh, we also would like to thank our uh, mentors. Uh, so we have Rodrigo Sequeira for, from AMD, uh, Melissa Wen, and uh, Andre Almeida from Igalia. Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, we'd also like to thank K-Unit engineers and the EMD engineers that helped us a lot in the process with reviews and feedback. And uh, of course, the XORG Foundation. Well, we are here because of you. Uh, so we'd also like to thank Google Summer of Code and the University of Sao Paulo. And uh, now, Mayra, the stage is yours. Okay, so first I would like to make uh, a small review on testing, explaining the different types of tests that we have, um, explaining the importance of unit tests, and also what is K-Unity. Um, testing is essential to a health code base. Tests help the maintainability and the robustness of the code, helping us to assure the correct behavior of the system. But not all tests are the same. Um, first, I must say that each test approach has its importance and validates a different type of behavior, so there is no test more important than another. The test pyramid can help us understand those different types of tests. And the test pyramid is like a metaphor that tells us to group software tests into buckets of different granularities. It also gives us an idea of how many tests we should have in each of these buckets. Um, I didn't create this pyramid. It's widely available in software engineering books and in test-driven development books. So if you want to check it out, um, you might look in these books. Um, in the top of the pyramid, we have manual tests. Manual tests are usually test cases that are executed manually by a tester. Uh, this is the only type of non-automated test in this pyramid. So it should be only used for test cases that cannot be automated. Because this kind of tests um, doesn't scale very well, because it can be very time consuming to run thousands of tests manually. Next, we have end-to-end -end tests. End-to-end -end tests test the system the same way a real user experiences it, trying to simulate a user's step-by-step -step experience. Um, this concept might match us better on web applications, where we can have like uh, a test case that covers from the UI to the database, um, such as a test case for a registration in an e-commerce website. But in the graphics stack, we can think about RenderDoc and GFX Reconstruct that are testing tools that can help us to evaluate performance for um, test cases based on the user's experience. 
Next, we have integration tests. Integration tests test a particular functionality um, of the system that has dependencies on other functionality. The goal of these tests is to check the communication and the connectivity um, of the systems, of the components in the system. Uh, in the graphics stack, we have the famous IGT, uh, which has many test cases, most of them being integration tests, uh, although there are some unit tests in it also. Um, IGT really help us um, to check the user space APIs for the DRM drivers, but sometimes it can be hard to track down failures to the kernel changes. Um, this happens because here we are talking about black box testing, which means that we cannot see inside the box. We can only see the events that come in and out of the box. We cannot see the, how the elements communicate inside this box. So finally, in the bottom of the pyramid, we have unit tests. Uh, unit tests are the finest granularity of testing. Um, so this means that we can really test all possible code paths. The goal of the unit tests is really to evaluate um, having um, some confidence in the behavior of each isolated unit of code. So here we are talking about white box testing, which means that we can see inside the box here. So why introduce unit tests into the Linux kernel? Um, basically, we are thinking about avoid regression is the greater benefit from unit tests. Um, as developers, we end up spending a lot of our time um, tracking down regressions in the kernel. And it would be great to have a tool that points you where the error is. This would really reduce the time that we spend um, tracking down regressions. And then the developers could focus more uh, in the development of new features. Also, uh, with a proper testing stack, we can even avoid that those regressions uh, end up in the um, production branch. Also, unit tests can really help uh, refactoring the code. Developers will have more freedom um, to refactor code without the fear of introducing regressions. This can really help us to have a more healthier code base with periodic cleanups and refactors. As I said before, unit tests also help us to assert the behavior of small pieces of code, which means that we can assure the behavior of um, simple artifacts of code instead of checking complex behavior such as in IGT test cases. But there are some trade-offs. Um, first, uh, I must say that introducing unit tests uh, into the Linux kernel means more code to maintain. But the gain in maintainability is so higher that the benefit overpay the cost. Moreover, writing good tests demand time and effort. But once you write them, you can be confident that the regression won't be back again. And another important question might be, why haven't we introduced unit tests into the Linux kernel yet? Um, to put it simply, we didn't really have a framework to do it until now. But now we have the kernel unit testing framework, which is KUnit. Also, for companies, um, unit tests means a great business value. Um, as you can see in this chart, based on the book Applied Software Measurement, Global Analysis of Productivity and Quality, um, testing uh, with unit tests means that um, catching a defect with unit tests is 160 times um, less expensive than catching the same defect on the production branch. This means that if you spend $100 um, fixing a bug with unit tests, you would spend $16,000 fixing the same bug on the production branch. Also, you can see on the orange line of the charge that with a proper testing stack with unit tests, functional tests, and system tests, that most defects can be found in the testing phase of the software. So this would really um, help companies to save a lot of money. And as I said before, unit tests are the finest granularity of testing. And as such, is the cheaper alternative for companies for catching defects. So now let's run a bit more on KUnity. KUnit is the kernel unit testing framework. Uh, and it was introduced in mainline in 2019. And it was created and is currently maintained by two Google engineers. KUnit is currently growing around various subsystems, such as the FAT file system, um, the Thunderbolt driver, and also the DRM. 
um, can you need to focus on white box testing, which means that the tests can access internal APIs um, instead of user space APIs, such as we have in IGT test cases. And KUnit was inspired by some user space testing frameworks, such as JUnity for Java, um, Unit Test for Python, and Google's Test for C++. Um, writing tests uh, with KUnity has some great advantages for the developers. Um, first, we can test hardware agnostic code. Um, as developers, we know that sometimes hardware is not accessible, and having a way to test the software uh, without the hardware can be great. You can run the tests um, as a user space process with UML um, inside, virtualized inside KMU, and even deploying it um, to the hardware itself. Um, also, this can make CI cheaper and faster because you don't need these huge um, GPU farms to run the tests. You can run the tests like in a simple laptop or your home desktop. Uh, moreover, KUnit can be integrated into other platforms, even Windows through the Windows subsystem for Linux, and can be even integrated into IGT, as Isabella is currently doing right now. The ease to integrate KUnit into other platforms is a consequence of the ease to build and execute the tests um, in Linux. Basically, KUnit provides us a Python script that help us to build and run the tests in just a couple of seconds. Moreover, KUnit provides um, very little boilerplate and we can have a test ready in just a few steps, as Isabella will show you right now. Okay, so now we are going to look at a minimal code example uh, using KUnit. So here we have a pretty much a textbook example. So on the left you have the a sum function that has a little header thing. And on the right, you can see the actual test file that we would write for that. So it's really simple. We just take two integers, sum them, and return the result. And uh, first thing we do when writing a test is we include uh, the KUnit test header and then the header for the function we want to test. For static functions, this would, of course, be a little different, but uh, we can talk about that later if you guys are interested. So next thing, we have our test function. So we can just use one in this case, but of course you could split that in lots of functions. So first thing, you, you take in the KUnit test struct that has like, uh, if the test passed, uh, all the sorts of information, then you feed it into a KUnit macro. So we have expectations and assert assertion macros. And this one in specific, we are using the underscore EQ macro. So we're, we're testing for equality. Uh, first thing, we are testing basic properties we expect this to hold. So a sum has to be, has to have like a no element and stuff. Uh, then at last we test uh, extremal value, so just to see if it just won't explode. Uh, now we have some KUnit boilerplate. Uh, in this example it looks like half the file is just boilerplate, but in an actual test of course this wouldn't be the case. So we have this list with the KUnit cases, and then we can separate uh, each step that the test will run. Next thing, we have uh, uh, the test suit, uh, the KUnit suit struct, which has metadata for the test, and that then you can see it when you run it. And then we have the KUnit test suit uh, function, which is like a module init thing. Um, and that allows you to build this as a module or whatever you want. Now, we have a case of study. This was actually sent for AMD, and I wrote it. Uh, so we are testing the display RQ DLG cock, and that's the CN20 FPU thing. So um, this is pretty. This is a pretty simple function, as you can see. We just we are just getting a source format uh, class enum and a boolean. And we are doing like if and else to test uh, if it is a certain value, then we return a certain thing. And of course, this relates to the amount of bytes each enum, each format would have. Uh, so this is pretty simple. So it's a great example of what you can do with KUnit. And uh, of course, as engineers, we want to avoid uh, accidental changes to this sort of thing. Like this should be set on stone. So this is an excerpt of the test I wrote. So it's pretty easy to understand, like each line is uh, a test. 
And uh, here we are using assertions instead of expectations because we want to fail as fast as something wrong happens. Uh, you can check the full thing in the QR code provided. So uh, here we have three pretty simple examples. So we know basically that uh, these values should be returning this stuff. So you can see here in the assertions, like we are calling the function and checking the result just after. And uh, we can also use a more informed approach, like uh, if we have the access to the enum definition, like I did here, I can just look that there are some values that are assigned to others. So DM model eight is actually assigned to DM444 underscore eight. So I can check that those match. And I can also check some other values that I expect to match, like uh, DM422 underscore eight uh, with a Boolean set to false and then true, they should match. Uh, now Magali is going to take a look at another case of study. So during the development workflow, we may, we may often wonder what are good situations where KUnit or unit tests in general may be valuable for us. And to answer that, we prepared two uh, real life case scenarios to show you to answer this question. So the first one is this one, which is catching regressions with KUnit. We are going to talk about this DCN21 update BW bounding box case. Uh, so this is a function that is found under the display driver from AMD, specifically in under the DML folder, which is supposed to contain um, floating point operations uh, files and stuff. So the first step is, uh, the, the first thing we have to do is identify a problem. So in this case, this function uh, triggered the stack size warning. So whenever we would compile the kernel, we would get this um, compilation warning. And naturally, uh, there was an attempt. And uh, so from this problem, um, uh, someone tried to fix this problem naturally. And this solution ended up introducing a regression. And after someone noticed that there was an regression introduced by trying to fix this compilation warning, a new patch was sent uh, to fix both the regression problem and the initial compilation warning problem. So from this, we, uh, we can try to answer the question how to include unit tests in such development workflow. So the first step is we have to identify a problem. In this specific case, there's a global variable that is being constantly overwritten. And depending on the situation, this can be this can cause um, some important values to be lost. And after we identify the problem, we can write a test case. Since we know where and how this function is uh, fail uh, is not working as it is supposed to be, and we wrote a test case. And as you guys can see. This is the output that KUnit provides with um, the expectation, the expected values and the actual values. And also, we can see the failure. Now, the, the next step is we finally fix the code, and we also uh, run the test that we just wrote to see if it is now passing. And this is the output that KUnit provides for passing test cases, and that's it. So now to our third case of study, another regression-based test with KUnity now on the CDMUB. Um, first, we had a problem in the populate sub VP um, CMD DRR info function. Some 32-bit compilation errors due to floating point operations out of the DML folder that Magali just told it out. And there were attempts to fix this problem that ended up introducing a regression that zeroed all the values in the struct, which was not ideal. And finally, um, a patch had to be sent to fix the regression and the original problem. As you can see, this is not the uh, most ideal workflow. Of course, the ideal wor workflow would be to have a problem and then a fix, but we know that this is not possible. So how can we include unit tasks in such a development workflow to make it more ideal? We can think about a workflow where we have a problem and then an attempt to fix, you run the unit tests, the unit tests will catch the regression, and then you attempt to fix again until all tests pass. And finally, you push your patch when all tests pass to the branch. Um, this, of course, this uh, workflow is not ideal, but at least uh, the regression will never end up in the code base. So this is great. So now let's jump into this third case of study. Uh, initially, we had a problem in this function. As you can see, there are a lot of floating point operations. 
And um, for those who are not familiar to the AMD GPU um, code base, um, there's a folder, the DML, as Magali told it out, where floating point operations are allowed. It's okay to have floating point operations there. But this function is not inside the DML, it's inside the DC folder. So those floating point operations shouldn't be there. And they were causing some 32-bit compilation errors. So those um, divisions were replaced by the div64 function. And as you can see, it looks OK. I mean, by just looking at it, looks like the function preserves its behavior. But um, this fix ended up introducing a regression. The behavior of the function was not preserved, and the mean vtotal supported and max vtotal supported value ended up being zeroed by this um, um, patch. So we decided to write a test case based on the behavior pre-regression, and all five test cases that we wrote are, are failing as expected. Um, and as you can see here, um, there are two important things to notice here. First, it's very easy to see the output of the function and the expected output of the function. So you can think about a workflow, uh, a more uh, test-driven development workflow, where you can run the tests in your laptop and you try to make a fix, you run the tests again until all tests pass. And you can be sure that the function that you wrote is behaving exactly as you expected. And if it's not, you can see very clearly what is the output of the function and what you expected. Also, in the bottom line of the log, you can see that all tests build and run in just six seconds. So it's fairly fast, and you can run the tests many times, and it won't be very time consuming. So finally, we reverted the regression, and we checked that all five test cases are passing as we expected. So Magali will explain you how to run the tests um, in your computer right now. So. After seeing why use KUnit, you might wonder how to run KUnit, and this is what uh, we're going to show now. So we, uh, we, set, we listed here three options. The first one and is to run KUnit on user space. So KUnit provides a Python script under the Linux repository, and you can just uh, run this line, and it'll run on user space, that is user mode Linux as a standalone process. So currently, this is not supported on AMG GPU, but we decided to point it out since this is the simplest uh, way of running KUnit tests. Also, the second option is to use that same script to run KUnit using a VM. So the only difference here is that you're now uh, passing the architecture as an argument. And this is actually the way that we have been uh, running KUnit for most of the for most of our project. Now, the third option that KUnit provides is the ability to run it on hardware. So that means that you can uh, build KUnit into the kernel and install it, and you can have it either built in, either as built-in or as a module. So if you have it built-in on boot time, um, the tests will be run, and you can check the output on the kernel buffer. And if you decide to have it as a module, you can just run that line to load the module and also check it on the kernel buffer. Now, another interesting thing that KUnit provides is the ability to have test coverage using GCOV. So test coverage, in summary, is a metric that shows us how much of our source code is covered by tests. And it also is a very interesting tool that may help us um, identify um, files that uh, with missing coverage. So for instance, suppose you have a file that is presenting has been presenting lots of problems, and the, then you notice that it has a uh, low test coverage. So that is a very strong indicator that that file may need more tests. So this is, uh, these are the results on the screen from the coverage that we achieved during the project. As we said, we mostly focused on the DML folder, which is on the bottom, and also on the DMUB file. So these are the results that we get using KUnit and GCOV. Now, as we reached the end of the project, we decided to summarize some of the things that we know now and some of the things that we still haven't found an answer to. So what we know, it's reasonable to test static functions. So this was a discussion that we have been having for quite some time during our project, because some books state that uh, it's not very 
nice, must I say, to test private functions. We should instead uh, use test the public functions that cause those private functions, but this would increase the complexity of the tests. So we came to the conclusion that, yeah, we can test static functions because we don't want anything much, anything very complex. Now, onto the things that we don't know is how to test static functions properly. So KUnit does offer an option to test uh, static functions, but it isn't a it doesn't have a general agreement whether that form of testing static functions is okay or not. On to, okay, so these are, okay. Uh, so what we know now is that it is easy to run unit tests without the specific hardware. So we actually thought that we would need a, an AMD GPU to test the, to have the unit tests running, but we found out that no, unit tests are, unit tests are really, you making use of the word unit, so there's really no need to have a an AMG GPU, so no need no need to have the specific hardware for that. Also, in the beginning of the project, we thought that we might need to make some device mocking, and it is it is just like the point above, not really necessary. Our unit tests really follow the word unit here. Now. Onto the things that we don't know, with the conversion of the K self tests in the DRM subsystems, we the, these K self tests they could be run using IGT, and with the conversion of them, we have come to the question: Do we still want to run those K unit tests inside IGT, or do we want them to be run as a standalone? So we pointed out here some pros and cons of running inside IGT. Basically, the first comment is that these are what most companies have. Most companies already have a CI infrastructure that allows the tests to be run through IGT. So if we allow KUnit tests to be, to be run inside IGT, it is easier to integrate into this already existing uh, infrastructure. But the thing is, KUnit uh, already offers a script to run the tests, so why would we need to have uh, IDT su to support this as well, since it's one more piece of code to maintain. And the last question is, we have the tests inside AMD GPU module, instead of having one specific module for the tests. The thing that we haven't come to a conclusion yet is, should we keep it this way or switch to standalone modules? And what are the implications of both approaches? And that's it, if you've got any questions. So the question was if uh, AMD already has a suite of tests and we are extending it or not. Uh, so from what we know, AMD already does tests with IGT and they have their own suits for other operating systems. Uh, but then we are lacking many tests in the, specifically in this front, in the FPU code, because uh, like Linux, Lin Linus doesn't like it. And <laughs> so AMD is kind of on its own to, to maintain that kind of inf infrastructure. <laughs> oh, no, I meant uh, Linus doesn't like uh, FPU code in the kernel. Oh. Yeah. Any more questions? Uh, so the question is, why can't we run KUnit uh, on user space? Uh, I think Mayura can answer that. Okay, so there is a couple of guards in the AMD GPU code that uh, is basically for config x86. And the config UML has um, config x86 also, but um, doesn't have the specific structs, um, specific um, field structs for x86. So it's a very simple patch. Um, I wrote it a couple of um, 
couple of months ago because the test coverage o um, only runs with UML. So we wrote like in you know, a side branch. It's a very simple patch, just adding like a or in the guards. Um, so if uh, just skipping these guards, if it's UML. But uh, AM, there was a discussion a while ago if we should uh, introduce UML into the AMD GPU. And it would be one more architecture for AMD to maintain. So we are not sure if um, we are going to have uh, UML in AMD GPU. But it's a possibility is like a 10 line patch. It's a very simple patch. Just to make a parenthesis here, uh, we're talking about UML because that's what KUnit runs on user space. So, yeah. yeah. Okay, so that wasn't really a question, but Jiso uh, <laughs> pointed out that uh, Intel already had a pretty nice solution for running uh, unit tests inside IGT. Uh, so, yeah, there's that. I'm not aware if that is using KUnit, though, is it? Uh, no, it's a custom handle. Oh, okay. Okay, uh, but the problem here, like um, Isa is Isabella is right now um, writing a parser for the KTAP because um, KUnity may just um, give you a KTAP, like a log that we need to parse. Currently, IGT has IGT self-tests, which parse the results of the self-tests. So the problem is like to maintain uh, another parser because the KUnit tool has a parser right in wrote in Python. And we need basically to maintain another part, or another parser in C that Isabella is um, doing right now, if you want to talk more about it. Yeah, so I, I wasn't aware that you were talking about the case of testing, but uh, yeah, that's exactly what Mayura said. So we actually already have uh, uh, some somehow of a parser, and we can use pretty much the same infrastructure they, they already have for this. But uh, we need some uh, other tools because KUnit um, try to uh, make their 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 I don't know report style like a TAP that's a test anything protocol, but uh, for the kernel. So that's KTAP. That's how they call it. And uh, so we are implementing that, and it would be a very similar solution to what you said, but uh, it, it needs a whole different. Uh, yeah, and then it's a whole different parser. So, go on. Yeah, first of all, thanks for uh, trying to, yeah, for teaching us how to improve our messy code. <laughs> and some, you know, the stuff that, that you've discovered there, um, which is great. In regards to self-tests and IGT and all that, I really like that KUnit, at least what you've done, it's, it's unit testing without needing hardware, right? I guess from that standpoint, I would prefer to stay separate from IGT because IGT requires real hardware. KUnit, you can run quickly with quick turnaround even if you don't have UML. Like you say, six seconds to build, boot up the emulated environment and test it. So I, I think from that standpoint, my preference would be to keep it separate. Okay, so what uh, he said is that um, he would prefer to keep it separate from IGT because IGT depends on real hardware. So 
uh, yeah, we agree with that. Uh, and that was something that uh, Bihal Wynjarski already pointed out in the mailing list. So we are aware of that, but uh, that's why we are bringing up this discussion because we're working with AMD and for them it would be very profitable to bring that to, to IGT because uh, it makes their life a lot easier uh, to integrate with their already existing CI because it would be like just more, I don't know, two seconds to run those tests. Uh, so it would not be so much of an overhead, but of course you could o utilize uh, real machines better. Uh, any more questions? Okay, so uh, Martin uh, answered that, uh, asked that, um, like if we could, uh, we have some inputs on device mocking because he tried and he wasn't very successful. <laughs> uh, we didn't, um, like in the first couple of weeks in Google Summer of Code, we were, me and Magali were working on device mocking. And there is a patch currently in the KUnit list. Um, there is doing some platform device device mocking, but we didn't really um, explore it because we didn't really need it. We discovered that it wasn't really necessary for the AMD GPU code. Um, probably for other applications is necessary. And I believe that the guys at Google, like um, David Gohl and Brandon Higgins, is are currently working on it. They are also working on mocking functions. So you might uh, use this, maybe. <laughs> so we have a question from the live audience. Uh, did you find any particular advantages to running KUnit under UML over QML? other than the code coverage support? So the, the main advantage is really running it in user space, so that's a lot less, uh, it has a lot less from the hardware itself. Uh, you just, you don't need any virtualization, you can just run it on the, on the kernel that you already have. And that's the main advantage really, uh, apart from timing, it is really quicker. But uh, I don't think there's much more else than that. Yeah, and the coverage that's already mentioned. Anything else? Okay. So what's your goal with this? Are, are you going to continue or do you think that this project is now done? Uh, so the question was if we're going to continue with the testing and stuff. So it was really exploratory work. We did not do so many patches, but uh, we, we laid the groundwork for it. We hope that AMD engineers do it themselves as well right now. Uh, but uh, we, of course, uh, if we see something that can be improved upon uh, with, uh, I don't know, an okay amount of effort, of course we're going to do it. Um, yeah, and we are also looking for mentees uh, to do to continue the work, uh, maybe on other subsystems as well, not only on AMD GPU. You. You're welcome. Okay. Uh, so that's it. Let's wrap it up. <laughs>
Hi everyone. Uh, my name is Wayne, and I'm from AMD. And today, this session, we'd like to talk about uh, the progress of MSD improvement from AMD brought so far nowadays. So uh, today, I will quickly go through the, about the background knowledge of MSD and talk about the roughly uh, go through the MSD flow in Linux nowadays, and then we'll uh, address a bit about the progress of enhancement brought from AMD so far, and then we'll do a demo. So why say MSD? MSD is the multi-stream transport mechanism that's intro get introduced uh, start from DP 1.2, which uh, leverage the uh, time division multiplexing like mechanism to uh, to have uh, to en that enable us to enable multiple streams by sharing uh, the same DP link. So. Uh, these two figures show a common to, uh, MSD topology. One is the DESI chain, and the other one is the trader like uh, topo MSD topology constructed by the NST hub. So, what makes MSD uh, different uh, compared to legacy DP SSD transport, transportation mode? That uh, basically that. Uh, with MSD, that we need to probe uh, all possible string syncs among the MSD topology, and on the second hand, that uh, now we cannot only estimate available bandwidth by local link, uh, DP link training status only, but we also need to uh, understand that. Uh, the uh, capability of each uh, output port along this end-to-end virtual channel path, especially for the DSC uh, capability. So uh, the, all the interactions that I just described in previous slide that uh, relies on a lot of uh, different types of cyber messages that introduced in MST, and currently that the DN there provide uh, helper functions to help uh, different driver vendor to construct uh, uh, all their necessary cyber messages to interact with different MSD devices within the MSD topology. So uh, let's take an example that uh, at the bottom that we can see that uh, before we enable the lean uh, string to uh, uh, MSD string sync, then we need to send out, uh, after we enable lean strings, in our internal pipes, then we thereafter should send our allocate payload cyber message to allocate payload on each uh, allocate bandwidth on each uh, DP link to get our string eventually routed to the target string sync. So uh, this figure shows uh, uh, give a rough glimpse of uh, what's the implementation nowadays in Linux code. Uh, let's look at the bottom left-hand corner. That while we plug in a load branch MSD branch device in, uh, to the system, then at first that uh, our driver will uh, probe the topology and to, uh, to find out all the possible uh, possible string things in the MSD topology. Then we will create the ion connectors to the user space. Then user space will later on trigger us to probe. Uh, probe the edit by sending out the remote I2C read uh, message and also send out remote DBCD read message to read out the capability of each uh, output port. Then after automate check and commit tail, then after enabling our pipes for the strings, we also need to send out the LK Palo cyber message to LK bandwidth from uh, each DP link to each DP link. So ideally, at this step, then uh, all, string, uh, all string is settled down successfully. <coughs> and if we unplug a non loot device from an MSD topology, then uh, look at the right-hand side. Uh, the left connected branch device will detect the disconnection of the, the output port, then will broadcast upward to the source. Then source will update the topology data structure in the memory and also uh, fire a hot plug event to the user space. Then user space will later uh, will react accordingly to ask our driver to probe uh, most and capabilities against and do the LCAT and DLCAT uh, behaviors. 
And what about that? If we unplug a loop branch device from the system, then uh, there's no more uh, cyber message, uh, which is quite straightforward. Then uh, it will just, uh, user space will just ask us to disable pipes, then we will disable strings, then that at the end that we will destroy the uh, structure, uh, data structure in the memory. And that's pretty, that's the rough whole MSD flow in Linux implementation nowadays. So what uh, what we did so far to improve the user experience of MST uh, from ND GPU perspective that we uh, we improve in following different perspective perspective that first of all is about the MST flow we met, we were mainly focusing on uh, dealing with problems that we encounter while doing hot plug hot unplug and we try to align our code with the DIN framework, and also we do adjust some code in the DIN there to have that uh, align with the specification in DB spec. And as for DSC, which is a key feature to enabling high resolutions, uh, multiple high resolutions more in MSD scenarios that we, are tr we were trying to um, have our DSC be better compatible, uh, have better compatibility with different MSD hub, because some MSD hub doesn't uh, uh, doesn't follow the the DP spec. And as for DP2, that uh, in DP2 that it, it bring us a, a new encoding method as uh, one to add and one three two bit encoding format, and another one is the DSC pass to feature. Then we also need to adjust our code and also in the end there to support those both uh, features. And as for sustaining perspective, that we are proposing an, a way to add, low, uh, add text into the steps that I just described in previous slide, that we want to break it down that whether each NST step get complete successful or not. And based on that, we are developing an IGT, and to uh, with that IGT that we will trigger a uh, uh, driver will trigger a hot plug uh, virtually, and then we'll go through all the steps and uh, monitor whether each steps get complete or successfully or not. Then based on that, uh, hopefully that we can catch any regression immediately. Okay, so. At the end, I will give the de demonstration about uh, the scenario that I have an ASIC, uh, ND ASIC, and plus a MST hub with two DP output port and one HDMI output port, which we use to light up three 4K 60 monitors at the same time. And uh, for lighting up under these scenarios that we definitely need to use the DSC. So, uh, and later on, I, I'm going to unplug each monitors um, one by one and then plug in again. Then you can see that all the monitors get light up accordingly.
Hello, um, I'm Eric. I'm here to uh, rant a little bit about how casual graphics development has gotten kind of uh, not so fun uh, since uh, since we're moving away from OpenGL and over to Vulkan. Yeah. So first, I want to um, address kind of like a little bit of a comparison of uh, OpenGL and Vulkan seen from uh, people like seen, seen through the eyes of people who are writing casual programs, so program, programs that don't need to squeeze all the perfor CPU side performance out of uh, out of the driver, and uh, but still needs to use uh, graphics features. So OpenGL is fairly easy to to get started with. Uh, you know, like a minimal op application here is. Uh, 22 lines of code, um, and yeah, it's pretty straightforward what it does. It clears the screen, draws some uh, triangles with some colors, and yeah. Vulkan, uh, it's not quite the same. Um, yeah, it's not it's not quite as bad as I say here, uh, but it's usually you have a first uh, your first triangle takes about a th thousand lines of code. And it's not particularly fun code to write either. Um, so if you look at um, the pros and cons from the, these casual developers, uh, like it's, it's kind of looking a bit bad for OpenGL here. Uh, it's easy to get started. It's easy to, oh sorry, get looking bad for Vulkan. Uh, it's, like OpenGL is kind of winning uh, on this comparison. However, there's one major thing, and that's that OpenGL is not really moving forward. It's not adding new GPU features. So if you want to write uh, casual programs that are targeting bleeding ed edge things, mesh shaders, uh, ray tracing, these kinds of things, OpenGL isn't really a viable option. So. Um, so what do you do, right? How can we uh, r like get rid of how having to write these thousands uh, of lines of codes uh, just to you know do draw some simple meshes and stuff like that? So there's some alternatives there. One is uh, to use pre-existing middleware. Uh, another one is to create something new, hopefully better middleware. And the last one is to expose new uh, op uh, features through OpenGL and Zinc. So a few middleware solutions that I've looked at. Uh, BGFX is one. It provides a, uh, a C and a C++ API. Uh, it's actively maintained. But sadly, there's like a problem with it at least from my perspective, is that uh, it's you're not really targeting Vulkan with that. You're targeting kind of this abstract BGFX uh, abstraction layer, which uh, means that you kind of like you get all of these problems of uh, least common denominator, unless you kind of bend over backwards in order to uh, check for all these features that might be, you know, uh, required by the spec. You're also targeting, like the, you're, when you're compiling a program for BGFX, it, it will compile a bunch of variations of your shaders to for all possible backends uh, of BGFX, even if you're just targeting a single uh, API. So it's, it's I, I would say it's a fairly good option, probably for some pe people, but it's uh, it feels a bit heavy for for some other stuff. Another option is something called VEZ, uh, made by AMD and the GPU Open project. Um, that one targets Vulkan dire directly and is kind of focused on removing these pain points. Um, sadly, it's been about for three years now, I discontinued pretty much. AMD is not updating it. There is an uh, open source fork of it, uh, or like there's a fork that has commits, but it's like 13 commits in the last three years also. It's not really going forward at 
much speed. So another option is to create uh, something new that uh, that uh, helps you out. And like what I'm thinking is like kind of gl glue for uh, for Vulkan. Um, it would, uh, I think, to be useful and practical, it would need to kind of almost become kind of official, uh, like used in, like if you download a, uh, a Vulkan example, you want it to use this by default, otherwise otherwise it's just yet another, uh, yet another support library that might be marginalized and stuff like that. Um, yeah, and it, we need stuff like uh, being able to create, uh, re like, programming Vulkan feels a bit Kafkaesque. You, you're like filling out all these forms and uh, kind of being directed to different floors and uh, uh, like bend over backwards everywhere. Um, so we need, I think, helpers for a lot of common stuff. Um, barriers is yeah, painful, uh, and uh, helpers for this would be great. And yeah, memory allocations. Um, for memory allocations, there's a fairly good solution actively maintained by AMD anyway, the VMA library. Um, yeah, and for barrier placement, we also have something in Mesa for D3D12, uh, D3D12 resource state helpers, which maybe could be ported into to help with Vulkan stuff. And yeah, fixed function shaders, because having to like fill out this huge uh, pipeline stuff for just draw drawing a textured rectangle and stuff like that is a kind of little bit ridiculous. And I think if uh, f for something like um, fixed function stuff, it could also be an opportunity to modernize stuff a bit over what OpenGL does. So if there's lighting, we might be able to do uh, physically based uh, lighting instead. Like stuff like SG sRGB rendering should, I think, be the default, uh, things like that. Uh, yeah, and uh, we also probably need stuff like vertex streamers. So you can do similar stuff with GL begin, GL end to kind of quickly spit out some triangles. Yeah, and the last option is to uh, to leverage uh, Zinc instead and kind of let that do a lot of these things for you. Um, that has the benefit of uh, OpenGL having a huge ecosystem that uh, that we can kind of uh, reuse. Uh, but um, in order to like use this in an application, you would have to kind of link the whole GL driver into the application because otherwise you know, it wouldn't necessarily load the right, the right driver. This is similar to what I think, I believe, Xplane is currently doing and some other uh, applications. Uh, I'm, like, I guess that's similar to what OS Mesa would do, but you need the ability for it to spit out the rendering at the end into, into your own uh, Vulkan command stream. Yeah, and then the last point uh, problem with that is, I think, creating stuff like extensions for ray tracing and mesh shaders in OpenGL just to be able to use it through one single uh, GL implementation sounds like a lot of work and uh, probably not something that anyone else is going to be interested in. So it might be an uphill battle. Anyway. So I don't have a good solution. I think I think the right solution will probably be different for different applications or and different people. But uh, I would love for us in the community to think a bit more about how we do this, how we can do more Vulkan content without having to use a huge game engine or something like that. So that's pretty much it. Uh, Thank you, Collabra, always hiring. Uh, <laughs> and uh, yeah, if someone has any questions. Okay, if uh, someone has questions or wants to discuss this further, please come to me and yeah, if someone has great ideas, I, I'm all ears.
Hi, uh, my name is Kevin Bracey, and uh, I am uh, will be uh, talking about uh, uh, updates on the Open Chrome project. So, um, first of all, the Open Chrome is a, basically it's a graphic stack for Via Technologies Chrome graphic engine, and this stuff is really old. So, you know, I'm sure people, some people heard of Via, but they're basically out of the chip business. But you know, there's still people who use it. So. You know, the work continues to support those people. Um, so um, since um, XDC 2019, that was the last time I spoke about it. Uh, I did a presentation on that. And uh, since then, um, I uh, did some, you know, change in my development environment and validation environment. And um, one of the uh, things that I finally did was um, I ditched Ubuntu-based OSs, which was pretty nice, but... Um, you know, they didn't have the, they dropped the 586 or 46 support like 10 or 12 years ago. And I always wanted to find an OS that I could do a, what I call a 586 processor class compile. Uh, and the reason why that's such a big deal to me is because VIA sold this processor called the C3 processor, and it doesn't have a couple features that makes it look like a Pentium Pro or P6 or 686 class processor. So uh, in order to run it with the C3 processor, you have to do a 586 compile, which is like a, basically a Pentium one in from like 93 or something in terms of the instruction set support and uh th this is because there's this thing called the cle 266 chipset it's like the first generation one uh we like to support it we like to give some love to it so that's why um uh, i've been um, thinking about migrating to gen 2 for many years but i finally did it because you know they dropped support for 32-bit and I installed it to, a, I don't have it here, but to a SanDisk Extreme USB stick, which has very high endurance. So it's like lifetime warranty. And I'm not trying to do advertisement, but I installed it. I recently built the image. I, it could boot it. I'll test it next week uh, with my partner. And uh, we do mainly now the validation on uh, Gen 2 because it has excellent 32-bit support even today. And uh, this thing called Nopix because my partner, uh, Eric Cutson, who uh, actually built at the last minute. So uh, he's not here today, but he likes Nopix. Nopix is a, like a Debian-based OS that is, um, what should I say, a RAM disk. It's a RAM RAM disk based distribution. He really likes that. So he does a lot of testing. He catches a lot of bugs and I have to go fix it. So I really appreciate Eric for fixing all the, pointing out all the problems with my code. Um, okay. So um, uh, I, there's several graphic stacks in the open Chrome, like any other, you know, typical graphic stack. Uh, DDX, there's not a lot of work going on on it right now. Uh, so this is like the summary of what I did over the last three years. There's not a lot, that many commits. Uh, for the DR, DRM side is where a lot of the action has been going on. And um, I finally uh, did atomic mode setting uh, implementation, which uh, Intel's Daniel Vetter has been pushing me since 2017. Kevin, do it. You know, Kevin, do it. And, you know, I, I finally forced myself and I did it. Um, he was kind of right that it's not that bad. It's only maybe a few hundred lines of additional code. Uh, but, you know, it took a lot of time because it's really hard to debug the problem, and I'm not good at debugging it. Um, so there's still the gamma correction palette initialization that's missing, so it's probably not really full implementation yet, but it works. Um, and then um, the difficulties. Uh, so the, this is the thing that kind of struck me in 2021. And, you know, again, you know, I don't want to get into trouble, so I'm not going to, like, criticize any particular person, but, you know, sometimes, like, they make changes to the code, but mine is not in the the DRM subsystem tree, so I don't get any help, so I have to go figure it out if they change something in the code. And, um, you know, sometimes I can't really figure out what the problem is, so these two cases I pointed out here with actually some of the commit uh, IDs, uh, some of them took like like six months, three months, you know, because I wasn't that good. There's like a huge gap in the commit um, date if you actually go look at it, uh, search by my name and, and my uh, special upstream uh, repository. 
Uh, so, but the last cu couple cycles have been pretty nice to me. So, you know, I've been able to keep up with the uh, DRM subsystem. I think there's going to be a new right, pull request coming out soon, right? You know, probably a few days. Um, okay, so I'll probably be working on that pretty soon. Um, so, um, since I got these issues taken taken care of finally, and 2021 was miserable, but I overcame it. Uh, so I started thinking, you know, I should do this. I should try to get it into the tree, right? And unfortunately, well, not unfortunate. I, I, I wanted to time it against XDC 2022, and here I'll be saying, oh, I finally got it into the tree. That was my original plan when I applied for this speaking slot. Uh, I'll talk about what happened to it, but I did various, like, preparation work. Um, and then... Uh, what happened? Oh, so, and then finally, I think it was, sorry, I'll go back to the pre, no, previous one. So I submitted the code around mid-June 2022, which was really like the last chance to possibly have a chance shot at getting it into the tree before XDC 2022. So I, 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 I aimed for like mid-June and mid to late June, not too bad. Uh, so I ended up having um, basically only had three versions of the code. The first one did not work with the standard tree, only worked with my custom version. Uh, so people pointed out the problem. So then I released a second one and a third one. Uh, second one apparently, apparently compiles correctly. And the third one has some additional improvements, but it's not really that different. Uh, it was very painful to generate 32 patches manually and I don't know how to do it Auto automate the thing it's really I really hate doing the 32 patches thing uh, so I um, hope I was hoping it will be um, accepted by now uh, unfortunately some things did not work out and one of the unexpected part was the I expected a DRM subsystem maintainers there are two people early and better I think Dave, Daniel, Daniel Vedder's not here today, but uh, they didn't really, really respond to it much unexpectedly. I was hoping they will kind of, you know, point out this or that, but I didn't hear much. And and then in, then the matter was taken care of by the DR and MISCs, uh, you know, main developer. And initially he, he was willing to, you know, pull it in, but then didn't like something in the code. And that was with this UAPI thing with acceleration. Basically his philosophy is if you don't, if you're not having acceleration, why are you using UAPI? That's his point. And um, so that basically was a deal killer to me. And the reason for that is because I'm planning to do acceleration implementation soon and I'm already working on it. And uh, I didn't want to really change a lot of the code at this point, so I decided to kind of abandon the effort for now. Um, I'm planning to, you know, uh, get back into it and definitely, you know, try in, in the future. But next time, I definitely going to get the UAPI implemented with acceleration working uh, as a, you know, precondition. So the current version that doesn't have acceleration with only mode setting, I'm just going to kill the effort. So the oh the so the development roadmap uh, so I have to really get the command submission stuff working, and also um, there's a there is a DRI one era legacy code which I'm sure a lot of people some people in the DRM you know development committee want to get rid of that legacy code. Um, I'm trying to kind of update it so that maybe someday we could get rid of that legacy stuff. I guess that's my small contribution possibly to the DRM subsystem development community. So, uh, but however, the DRI1 code has some benefit to it. So I'm going to reuse it, especially I discovered that the, the, the command verifier, I could pretty much like compile without too many changes. And then VIA had some code dump for the DRM, uh, their own version, which didn't get accepted into the mainline. So. And then the DDX side, uh, I was planning to do a separation between the active development branch and legacy branch. And because it's, it's the libdrm dropped auto tool support, it's very difficult to support uh, backward compatibility in terms of be able to compile in really old X servers. So I want to drop the legacy stuff and separate the code. And then for Mesa, there is actually Unicrome code from a long time ago trying to revive it and reuse it. 
uh, because I don't think I could really reinvent the wheel. And for the their newer engine called Chrome 9, this thing doesn't, it was like binary only and it didn't really, didn't never disclose it. So I don't think I will really try. So that's basically uh, what I'm planning to do over the next couple of years. So uh, thank you very much for listening to my presentation today. Thank you.